So good morning. We are about to start uh, this morning's session. So the first speaker of today is Alessandra Pluda, who we talk about uh, evolution of vector fields on flexible curves and surfaces. Alessandra, it's up to you. Thank you very much for the introduction. First of all, I want to thank the organizer for this beautiful conference. Finally, we are here in present. It's a, a bit emotional about this. We, still, we are still on the pandemic, but it's nice to see you physically present here. So after the really amazing talk uh, of yesterday by, by Guido, we come back a little bit, come to Earth. And uh, I'm going to talk about a project, I'm going to project with um, Christopher Brandt and Georg Dolzmann. And I'm going to give you some basic about, uh, a, some basic about this PDE problem. And uh, I hope uh, it uh, will be uh, useful, particularly for the young part of the audience. So, uh, at least to give a little bit of a context, uh, 50 years ago, Canam and then Elfrich proposed a model uh, for um, modeling uh, the red blood cell. So we are so used to this perimetric problem and to see roundish shape, but the biconcave shape of red blood cell, it's uh, really, it can really catch our eyes because it's extremely different from what we are used to. So already from this particular shape, uh, one realized that uh, the area functional and the plateau problem are not useful to model this kind of problems. And so there should be something else involved. And uh, what is, was, is being proposed by Canam is that um, what is important in this model is the bending energy. So there is an energy uh, that uh, not only real, uh, it's not only rate of how big is the surface, but, but also how much it's bended. And um, the energy that they propose is of this kind. So we have um, the integral over a surfaces. So we have, a, let's say, smooth immersion. Here, regularity does not matter. And we are integrating a constant times h, but it is the mean curvature minus h square, a h uh, zero, everything square. h zero is called spontaneous curvature. And it is, in some sense, the natural curvature that the object want to have. And then there is another term that it is related with the Gaussian curvature of the surface. So this uh, problem uh, already in this shape here, it's very different from usually the area functional that we are so used to minimize in the calculus variation community because it's not a first order functional. So there is the mean curvature, which means that um, higher order derivative are involved, second order, order derivative are involved. And okay, this problem was, uh, this model was proposed by Canam and then by Elfrich. And the Elfrich, in a sense, generalized the model because he said that it's not only useful for red blood cell, but also for a more gener uh, generic uh, biological membrane and um, this um, uh, bilayer, um, lipid bilayer. So after this, uh, so in the recent years, there are so many models, not only for this uh, biological membrane, but also for liquid-liquid um, model. So this means uh, one wants to model uh, what is the interface between two liquids, how it's looked like. And also this kind of model can involve a similar functional. So, and all the models are always related to a function that it is related to the surface. Instead here, we are going to study a slightly different functional. I don't know how much suits from the application point of view, but what is interesting is in this functional that was being, has been proposed by Laraje and Mortisen is that we don't only have the surface, the geometric quantities related to the surfaces like the H, but we also have a vector field defined on the surface. So if you go back to this um, situation here, one can see here the model with a double layer, and here I can see like the area orientation of the molecules. And in a sense, this uh, vector field can model the orientation. So the function that we are going to study, for which I'm particularly interested for the analytical point of view, so I'm not so in the, in the modeling point of view, is uh, like this. So what we have, we have uh, an immersion, so a surface. You can also think uh, here like a surface inner, inner free is not important, but we are considering a d-dimensional manifold in Rd plus one. So you can consider also D equal two. And then we have a vector field defined on the manifold. And uh, we want to study this energy. 
but uh, as uh, as I just say, uh, immersion and uh, and vector field like like unknown. And the energy is uh, one half the integral of h plus delta divergence of eta to the power square to the power two, and then another part that is still related with the with the vector field, the grand vector field. Uh, yeah, this two is missing. And as you can see, there is like a coupling between geometric quantities of the surfaces and objects defined on the surfaces. So this is the novelty of this kind of model. So what we want to do with this problem, um, here it's a calculus variation conference. So we are interested in clearly minimizing the model. And uh, I said at the beginning, we need to talk about PD. Why about PD? Because we are interested in the formal L2 gradient flow of this energy. Uh, why I find this interesting from the analytical point of view? So besides the fact that can model something, I think it's particularly interesting to see a problem in which there is both a vector field on the surfaces and the surfaces and the coupling of these two objects, it's really important to the minimization. So it's not only that we have a vector field, but really that the interaction between the vector field and the surfaces play a role. As I just said, uh, I want to study the uh, L2 gradient flow of these objects. And to do this, we have to write the evolution equation. So this is not gonna be an evolution equation, it's going to be a system of equations. So we will have more than one equation. So why this? Yes? Yes? Yes, there is a square, sorry, a square is missing. Um, okay, so when we, why we are going to see two equations? Because when we are going to do a variation, we have to vary both uh, uh, the, the immersion and the vector field. So I have not talked about uh, the fact that uh, the immersion is in H2 and the vector field is in H1. This is the, naturally, the natural energy space. For who is not familiar, we can also think about smooth things. It's not important for the, it's not really important at the moment. So uh, we want to variate both the phi and the eta. And normally what one does in this kind of context is that um, the, the, the immersion is, var is um, we have a variation that it's only normal direction. So this new is the normal direction. And then uh, since we have also to variate vector field, what we are going to do, we are going to extend it uh, as, a, as a constant in the normal direction. So notice that this problem, this difficulty of the extension of a, of a vector field is there if you consider surfaces of higher order surfaces, higher order manifold. But in the case of curve, we can avoid this difficulty. In the case of curve, we can parameterize directly the curve we are going to see later. And we don't have this problem of how we, um, we consider uh, the direction we consider the vector field is naturally given by first addition. So as you can see here, after somehow long computation, one arrived to this form. And uh, what, why I'm showing you, it's not so important the shape, uh, all the things that we see here. The important part is that we see the gradient of H. So it's the gradient of the curvature times the gradient of phi, but it is the test. And the other is the gradient of the divergence. And also here, we see uh, several terms and the leading one in a sense will be this gradient of eta times the gradient of psi. So since I want to write an L2 gradient flow, what I want to write, I want to write um, the directional derivative of the energy, like uh, something in L2 times uh, in the scalar product with the test in L2. But here we have a gradient. So uh, to arrive to write the gradient flow, basically I have to integrate by parts. So finally, we arrive here. So if you consider a manifold, but it is uh, dimensional, you can also decide D is equal to non-bondant, smooth, orientable, and closed. And uh, with closed, I mean without boundary and compact. Then we have an immersion, but it will be the initial immersion, P0, let's say smooth, and the initial vector field. So we have to define uh, what is the grad, uh, L2 gradient flow. So what is the solution? So a pair of function that will be an immersion and a vector field that are time dependent, it's a family of function that evolve in time. It's a solution to the flow if uh, this uh, system is, is, uh, is satisfied. As you can see here, I ask uh, that uh, at time zero, the phi uh, is equal to the initial datum and it's the same for the eta. And I have not completely written the entire system because here there are several lower order terms, as you can imagine, here we had several parts. So we are going to appear somewhere. Uh, but what I wanted to, to stress is the fact that we have, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, 
uh, no, is correct, here is the Laplace Beltrami operator of the mean curvature. So this means that it's a four-forder evolution equation, and it's also quasi-linear. Why it's quasi-linear? Because we are doing the Laplace Beltrami on, on the surface. So we will have some higher order derivative here, here if you go to write this in chart. And uh, so we have something that it is four-forder for the phi, and then it's something that it is of order three for the eta in this equation here. But it is the equation that drives the evolution in time of the phi. And what is important is that here we have third order because we have Laplace Beltrami of divergence of eta. And here, that we have the evolution equation for the eta, we have only as a leading order term the uh, Laplace Beltrami of eta. So this means that here we have only two derivatives of eta, but here three derivatives of here. So one can see two things, only uh, looking at the higher order term, also not forgetting the lower order one, is that it's really a coupling because in the first equation appear the phi, but also appear the eta, and also the derivation order of eta in the first equation is higher than the derivation order of the eta in the second equation, which is the one that drives the evolution of eta. So this creates several difficulties, I would say. And uh, what we can see here that we have also a third order derivative of the phi because we have a gradient of h. So we have this coupling and the order is different. So if we look at the scaling of these two of these two equations, here we have something that it is dt and then fourth order. Here we have something that it is dt and second order. So we have some difficulty regarding what's the scaling. And then there are several other terms that we can treat without so many difficulties. So we can focus only on this term here. So since I want to write what it is a, a, a solution, I also have to decide in which function space I want to work. So there are more than one possibilities. Usually one work in an, can work in older spaces, ensemble spaces. For a reason that we are going to see later, I have to work in Hilbert space. So it's important that I don't work in Banach, but I need, need Hilbert. And um, we choose to pick up this space here. So we have uh, the initial datum that it is uh, in uh, HA, HK times HK, where K is a natural number big enough. So K is going to be bigger than the dimension over two plus three, for reason that we are going to see later. And then, uh, so this is the trace space, time trace space at t equals zero of the solution space. So here it's the solution space, what we have. So we have a dt of eta and, and, and phi. So we need at least h1 in space, it's a bit here. And then, okay, um, let's say that uh, here k is at least two, but basically will be bigger. We have something that it is at least h4 in, 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 in space. So here is the space where we work on h1, hk minus two, intersected with l2, hk plus two. This is uh, concerning the phi. And concerning the eta, we can ask a little bit less regularity because here we have four order instead for beta, we have only order three. And so we ask h1, uh, hk minus one, this time intersected with l2, hk plus one. So for the, who is not familiar with, with this kind of space, you can also think about the more regular space. Doesn't matter because we are going to choose H so big, but in any case, also when we perform free derivative, we are going to embed in continuous function. So we are going to have a Banach algebra. So let's think also about something more regular. What we want to do with this system? So first of all, we want to prove that uh, the system has meaning. So what for us means having a meaning is that the system is well posed. So at least we want to show that the flow starts, at least for a short time that we, we, we can let the flow go. So what uh, this means, we want to prove existence and maybe also uniqueness of solution. So notice this, this uniqueness will be a, a particular notion of uniqueness because it's a uniqueness up to reparameterization. We have to think that we are in any case considering a geometric object, so reparameterization are always there. So it cannot be really unique as a function, but it's going to be unique up to reparameterization. It's unique as a set that will evolve. So this is what we want to prove and for a, a small time. So when uh, I have introduced this notion of solution here, I can call this a um, case strong solution. And one can think about a uh, smooth solution as classical solution. So we want to show that uh, exists a unique case strong solution in the, mini in the sense that I just explained. And then one uh, also would like to say a little bit more about them. So for example, proving a stability result. What I mean with stability, um, I mean that um, 
when we start close to a local minimizer of a problem, we would like to show that the flow exists for every time, for t that goes plus to plus infinity. And for t that goes to plus infinity, we converge to another local, to a local minimizer of, of the function. And keep attention to the fact that we converge to a local minimizer, but it's not necessary the initial local minimizer here, where we start close to. So it can be also another local minimizer. So this is a kind of result that is said to be stability, as maybe you have noticed, I have removed the M, the dimensional manifold, and I put S1, so I restrict this result to one dimension for a reason, because uh, in order to have this theorem that it's not an empty theorem, <laughs> we have to know something about local minimizer. And at the moment, we are able to discuss minimization in local minimizer of this problem only for curves. And then clearly a very nice goal will describe the long time behavior. At the moment, we have only partial results a blow up uh, argument result. So let's come back to the well postness. So I want to explain a little bit the strategy how we can prove this well postness result. First of all, I have already said to you that uh, when we are talking about surfaces, geometric option, objects, reparameterization are always there, we can avoid them. So first of all, we want to see which, what a reparameterization does to our system. So it is well known in the field of geometric flows. So this means no vector field. So you have erased the vector field equation and the vector field here. Let's think, for example, of a Wilmore flow but you can reparameterize the flow and this does not affect the equation. So what does this mean? That the evolution that you see, that is the one dictated by the first variation is only normal direction. And when we are going to reparameterize, you are going simply to add a tangential velocity term that does not change geometrically the evolution. However, since here we have both uh, evolving surfaces and a vector field defined on the surfaces, this changing of representation is going also to affect the equation of the vector field. And there will appear another term here that is given by the fact that, uh, that we are reparameterizing. But it does not matter so much. So we are able to redo a standard theorem in, a, in geometric evolution equation that it is as follow that if we have an evolution with tangential part X of this kind, so we have simply plus tangential part here and plus this other term here, there will always exist a family of different morphism such that when I reparameterize the phi and the eta with this family, I go back to the two gradient flow with zero tangential part. So slightly different for what happens in general for geometric equation, but not so problematic for us. So we can really come back to the uh, tangential part equal to zero. And this fact will be particularly useful to study the long time behavior because we study the long time behavior, we want to do some estimates that are only geometric. So this we can do. And so since we can reparameterize, we can pick up a parameterization that is particularly good for us. Um, so this is classical standard in uh, this kind of argument. So if I work only with curve, I can simply parameterize the curve and there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the parameterization curve itself, and I can go directly with a function. If I work in higher dimension, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, the point is that a good parameterization for this problem is the eight function formulation. So what I mean is that, I mean that I pick up an, in an initial smooth immersion. So here smooth is important because we need that the so this has to be a Riemannian manifold and we need a smooth metric on it. And then I can um, write the equation of evolving hypersurfaces as a scalar function, but it is exactly the eight function over the surface. So what I have, I want to describe an evolving family of hypersurfaces by a family of time dependent immersion. And I can write like the initial one or the reference one can also be not the initial one plus a scalar function in the new direction. And if I write this graph formulation, I can completely reformulate the system in terms of this scalar function. So before I had a system for a immersion and a vector field, now I want to write a system for a scalar function and a vector field. And this is standard because now that I know the shape of my immersion, that it is initial, reference surfaces plus rho nu, 
I can rewrite all the geometric um, quantities appearing in the system. So I had the, um, the Laplacian of H and so on. I can rewrite all of them. And I end up with something of this kind. So here I can really go in local charts. The, again, the shape of uh, the precise shape of this uh, of the system is not so important. We simply remind the fact that now we have a scalar equation for the row, and here we are going to see um, up to fourth order derivative in charts. And here the part related to the eta is up to two year plus the divergence to third order. So it's exactly the same shape of structure as this before. So now that we have this. Um, System is the system that we want to solve. And then I, come, I can come back to the original system by my reparameterization argument, because I show that I can always reparameterize. And I also can show that I can reparameterize always in a new, unique way. So if I get uniqueness for this system, I can also have uniqueness for the original one. OK, so now what is our goal? Now our goal is that if we take a scalar function in the, in the eta vector field in hk times H, hk, we want to show that there exists a positive time that can be also very small, but still it's there and still strictly positive. And the uniqueness, um, strong, uh, strong graph solution of this system in this uh, zero time, in this zero t interval of time. So this is our goal. So as you can see, um, the shape of the system is, is not particularly ple pleasant. So we have a lot of derivatives and so on. But I still want to explain to you the strategy of how we prove this kind of result because it's a, a very powerful strategy when you can apply to several problems. And to do so, I simplify strongly my problem. So I take a toy problem. You can see also think of something simpler than this. So I remain with the fourth order because, OK, before we had the fourth order, it was kind of nice. But you can also think about UT, then something that it is quasi quasi linear. So here we have something that depends on uh, first, second, and third derivative time u x x x x. You can also simplify and think of something like a u x times u x x. That's not really matter. And then initial datum. So before I had a system with two equations, two initial datum, a lot of mixed thing, but the strategy works in any case. It's not important. It's simply more technical. So let's stay to this simplified problem. And uh, for the sake of notation, I call the first uh, equation in one of m1 of u and the second equation m1 of u. So I'm really working in one dimension. I can think about a u from 0 t, t can be positive, we see can, that can be also plus infinity, times an interval, and maybe I put periodic boundary conditions to not have the boundary condition here, but it's simply another line. So we have this. Um, operator that describes uh, our true evolution equation with this, that goes from the solution from the solution space to the space of the right hand side times the initial space. Usually this I here is the time trace of the space here. But you can also think about, uh, I don't know, in this case, uh, C4 plus alpha in time, C1 plus alpha, uh, C4 plus alpha in uh, in space, C1 plus alpha in time, so the regularity and the C0 alpha times uh, C4, alpha, uh, C4 alpha. It's not really important who is E and F. So here is the strategy. So we have our problem. First of all, we, linear, we linearize the M around the initial datum. We, if we have a lot of lower order term, it's not so important. We can linearize also only the higher order part. So once we linearize, we end up with something like this. OK, sorry, this is not to be exactly linear. It's got to be fine because I don't have zero initial datum, but OK, it doesn't matter. And so what we do to linearize this, um, here I basically rewrite the equation in where all the um, lower order part of the main operator are with respect to initial datum. So once that I have linearized my problem, I can write my original problem as the, uh, zero equal to the old one plus and minus this part here, that is the linearized part. And then I can put the linearized part on this side and the other on the other. So here I have ut plus I have my L. And here what I have again, I have L minus M. So maybe I'm gonna write, uh, so it's maybe easier to put the notation. So, at the beginning, we had something like ut plus m of u equals zero. And now what I write, ut plus l of u 
equal L of U minus M of U. So I'm simply going to do the subtracting basically. So, so this is part zero of the strategy. Then part one is solving the linear problem. What does it mean solving the linear problem is that for every F in the space FT and for every initial datum, we want to show that there exists a unique solution to this system. And we also want some estimate. So I don't only want to show that there exists a solution and that the solution is global, but I also want an estimate. I want that uh, the norm of U in the solution space is estimated by the norm of the right hand side in, in the right space plus the norm of the initial datum. So this is step zero, that usually is um, already known in the literature. And then once I do this, I want to ap apply contraction mapping to this symbol. I introduce another operator, N. Uh, how is defined N is simply L minus M. So basically, it's this part here. Why it's called N? Because here, the L part contains only the linear part of the system, and here is something, something that describes the nonlinearity of the system. It's why it's N. And then I introduce K. And what is K? K is L minus 1 uh, N of U. And what I want to show is that K is a contraction. And once I show that K is a contraction, we have basically done. Why? Because I can apply contraction theorem. And uh, this means that there exists a unique U in the um, solution space, such that K of U is equal to U. But then here I simply use the definition of K, that it is L minus 1 times N of U composed with N of U, then I use the definition of N, but it is L minus M. Then uh, L minus one is linear, L was a linear operator. So I can do L minus one of L of U and I end up with U, L minus one of M and I end up with things here equal to U, U and U simplify. Arrive to L minus one M of U equals to zero, L minus one is linear, so M of U must be zero. And so we have basically solved our initial problem. So this is a strategy that is extremely powerful that can be used uh, for several problems and uh, probably ring a bell because when you have done contraction mapping principle, the theorem you have done for something to prove something, and this is basically the same story. Okay, usually in this strategy, the hard part is the contraction, show that it is a contraction. Uh, only a warning to show that it is a contraction, surely it's not going to be a contraction in the entire space, but one has to intersect with a uh, ball around the initial datum. So it's not a contraction everywhere, but it has to be small and we have to remain close to the initial datum. So it's why it's only a local in time result. Um, the point is that uh, in our problem, the very difficult part, strange enough, was not to prove that uh, K is a contraction, it's still very technical, but not that matter. The very difficult part was the fact that uh, there was no linear theorem in the linear theory in the literature available for our kind of problem. Because first of all, it's a system, it's a parabolic system, so we have less opportunity than in the uh, usual elliptic ones, and also scale differently. So we have this DT rho here, then when we have something fourth order plus three order, and uh, here we cannot get enough regularity from the eta to get the solution here. And here is scale, di scale difference. So, dt fourth order, dt second order. Sorry, here eta is missing. So uh, in the literature, we had not uh, a theorem that said to us that this uh, problem was solvable, so we have to do something by ourselves. And um, usually for this kind of problem, we use um, transfer, um, Fourier transform theory, but we do something differently. And we want to show existence of the system with lux milligram. So again, here I'm going to simplify and show you how to use lux milligram to show the existence of a equation, a solution of a equation. Because the strategy is basically the same and we have only much more difficulty related to four further, a lot of terms more, and the, the fact that we are on, on a manifold. So we have also the metric around. So I simply rewrite what is lux milligram theorem so we can have it in mind, we need an Hilbert space and the space that it is a space with a scalar product. Then uh, we have a bilinear form. And if we can prove that the bilinear form is continuous and coercive, that we know that um, 
for all k in uh, the dual of y, there exists uh, an element of h of a Hilbert space such that uh, for every phi in y, we have p h of phi equal to k phi. So I want to use this theorem to show the existence of solution for this problem. Again, as I told you before, I strongly simplify. I simply show you a little bit of the idea of what to do when we have eight equations. So we restrict to each equation ut minus uxx equal f, even in one dimension. So f it will be in L2. And then initial datum zero for simplicity. One can do the same also when the initial datum is not zero. OK. And we have that u is a solution to the eight equation, if and only if this v that it is e to the minus t of u solve this other equation, in which we have also this extra term v er that is going to be important. OK, so if I want to solve this problem, I can also solve this problem. It's the same. And we are going to solve this problem here. So to, do, uh, to apply lux milligram, I have to define an Hilbert space. So I need to define a scalar product. And I need to define uh, what is the linear map and the bilinear map that we're going to use. So I introduce um, a positive A and this scalar product here, but it is called LA because it, it reminds of L2 scalar product with a waiting time in front. And then I introduce this scalar product HA that should remind the H1 scalar product again with a wait in time in front. And here I have uh, for every f and g, ft times gt plus f times g times fx times gx. And as you can see, this is tailored on this problem. Because if I'm going to write this problem in a weak formulation, I end up exactly with these three terms times g times uh, the test. Okay, maybe g wasn't even not the best letter, but okay. <laughs> So now that I have these two scalar products, I can define an Hilbert space like, like as the closure with respect to the norm induced by this scalar product of C infinity completely supported function, and then the test space. And for tests, usually you usually use this infinity completely supported function. And then finally, I can define my linear map that, as we, we can see, is going to describe what happened on the right hand side. Notice that I'm testing by a time derivative of phi. And then this bilinear map, and again, notice that it's basically the weak solution definition of, uh, for the system, but I'm testing with a, with a derivative. So now what, uh, that we have everything, what we have to show that uh, P is continuous with respect uh, to the space here, so the topology we're using is the one of H, and uh, that it is a, it's co coercive. And uh, here is really the trick for coercivity. How can we do Lux Milgram for an evolution problem? So that is continuous, one can see. So Cauchy's Vart, basically. And uh, we can see also that it is coercive. Why? So the first term here is exactly this norm here. And then we can see that also these two terms can be written like A times P uh, in the normal L to the power square and phi x. So why this is possible, and here lies the entire trick of the story, is the fact that if we take any function in the space and we compute something like this, the weight, then there is the integral of f of the function times uh, derivative, then this is simply uh, by integration by part equal to this object here. But this is nothing by a times the L2 norm. And thanks to this equality, we can write this term here like this, and also this like this. And then it's easy to say that this is greater or equal than uh, the minimum between one and the of a uh, norm of the entire space. And so thanks to this, we have proved that uh, we have coercivity. So we are satisfying all the hypotheses by Lux Milgram. And so at this point, what to do? We apply Lux Milgram. And so we know that there exists a V in H such that for every phi in Y, we have PV phi equal to K phi. And this is nothing by, but uh, say that there exists a weak solution to the double star problem with time and derivative as, as a test. What we have still to do, we have to come back to weak, uh, strong formulation and of the original problem. So what we need to show is that we can uh, have any test, not only time derivative uh, as a test, but this is easily done with the shifting argument. And then uh, with, um, let's say, standard regularity theory, 
in this case is standard because we it's weak heat equation in our case is not so standard but doesn't matter we can show that u it's basically h1 in time h2 in space so even more if we simply do iterative uh, different quotients and we integrate by parts then we have also this kind of estimate and so this method gives exactly what we want in our case so i hope this is useful for you because it's um, a nice way to, to prove the existence of uh, evolution equation so let's come back to what we want to say with all of this then i can show uh, the kappa is a contraction that is suitably defined kappa is a contraction and then i have my short time existence result what is really more hard in my problem is the regularity theory for the linear problem because um, you have to keep in mind that I working on a manifold and when I'm working on a manifold there is a metric around and when we do this basic integration by part arguments to gain the regularity we have also the control we have also the term coming from the metric then I come back to the stability that I have announced before and the theorem is this nothing more why I come back to the stability I come back to the stability because I want to show something that is really purely calculus variation for curves. So it would be extremely nice to have the same thing, at least for surfaces, for the moment less less strict to curve. So what we want to do, study the minimization problem for curves. Because here we have to know something about local minimizer, at least that the minimizer exists. Because if you don't have a minimizer, I cannot say nothing for this theorem. So this comes to my second and shorter part of the talk, but it is the case of curves and it is a minimization problem. So now we erase everything we said now, it's not so important. We have talking about uh, evolution equation. Now we talk about minimization, totally different story. So first of all, we are so used to the fact that we can parameterize things, but we always forget that there is a difference between the image of the curve, like the set in the space, and the parameterization itself. Usually, that does not matter. Simply by a parameterization argument, I can solve my problem defined for curves as a geometric problem for function. But here we have also the vector field defined on the curve. So here the parameterization matter in a sense. So what we have, we can define a geometric functional, slightly different from before. These two terms here are exactly the terms that appear in the case of curve. Clearly, I don't have any more mean curvature because I don't have principal curvature. I have only one curvature. It's curvature, it's a curve. So this is um, basically second derivative of gamma in our claim parameterization. Then the, term, the shape is exactly the same, but it's added with length penalization term. Why it's added with length with, with length penalization term? Because um, if I magnify the shape of a curve simply without doing nothing else, the energy decreases. So since I'm, I have k, that scales like one over r to the power two. When I have ds, that scale like one over r. All this part here scale like one over r. So if I take a bigger r, this thing is going to zero. <laughs> but it's not, and the minimum is not obtained. So I simply can take a family of circle and be, uh, choosing a bigger and bigger circle, and the energy is going to zero. But it's not, a, it's an inf, it's not minimum. So this is not a well posed problem in the case of curves. So I have to add this length parallelization. So here we have something like a struggle between I want to become big to have a small curvature and I want to become small to have a short length. So here the problem becomes well posed. And the geometric problem is um, nice for regular embedded closed curve. So before I had a closed manifold, now we have a curve and maybe I also want this to be embedding. And class H2, it's only because it's the right energy space and the vector field class H1 exactly the same. So I end up with this minimization problem. I'm working of the curve like a set in the plane, so I can, minim uh, I can parameterize it on zero to pi on a fixed interval. I can ask that uh, the curve is regular. This means that uh, first derivative is different from zero. It's injective. Why I ask that it is injective? Because I want to ask that it's embedded in and then embedded and then I have a field. So a problem like this is still invariant uh, up to the parameterization and region motion. So if I found a minimizer, I can translate it and send it to infinity or I can rotate it. When I work with embedded curve, I can do maybe a bit more physical problem. This means that I, I can prescribe the area inside 
and also the length of the vector field. Because maybe if I want to model the molecules, I don't want that the vector field is too long. So this would be the problem one wants to study, but it's not exactly the problem we are going to study. We are going to simplify slightly the problem. So first of all, since I want to avoid the translation and the, and the, the fact that I can send the minimum to infinity, I can, um, I can fix uh, the mean of gamma of, and uh, of eta. And um, I have said that the curve is regular, so I can also fix the parameterization. This is a nice, uh, is a nice choice because when uh, the lower semi-continuity of the function are, it's very easy. So I end up with my problem here. And uh, what's important here is that I remove the embedding, the embedding request. So now my curve is merely an immersion. So I also have to change the definition of area. And now I'm going to use a signed area instead of area. So I can have a part of the regions with areas with a minus sign. So now area varies in number in R. And this is the minimization problem that we solve. So apparently these are very similar. The point is that if these two formulations are always the same, they are equivalent. So when the problem are equivalent, okay, if I end up with a minimizer of this problem here, but it is embedded, then I finished because I've, I'm also a minimizer of the problem before. If I have a minimization, a minimizer that is immersed, is not exactly equivalent, so we cannot come back. So in this case, a critical point are regular. This is not surprising, first variation and basically with the argument. And then uh, we have a lower bound for the energy. So this is also not so tricky, but I think it's interesting because the idea is that to get the lower bound, we have to decouple uh, the, the surfaces and the vector field. So the curve and the vector field, their contribution. But this can be easily done because the energy is bigger or equal than this form here. I have simply erased the length and uh, I computed the square. So I have all this part here. And then I can use um, Young inequality to decouple this term here. So we, maybe with a clever choice of, uh, of uh, epsilon. And so I have a part that is contributed to the curvature square and the part that to, contributed to the divergence of eta square. So I have a couple like this here. And then here, what I, what I do, I simply said that here we have entire gradient. Here we, we have a tangential divergence. So this object here, square control this here. So plus this minus this is surely positive. So I can erase this part and I end up with this. The energy is bigger or equal than this thing here. And then to conclude that we really found in a lower bound for the energy, I need to use Fenchel theorem. Uh, what I mean, the integral of uh, the modulus of kappa and here the modulus S to C is greater than equal to two pi. And then I use uh, older inequality. And then basically I can find the lower bound, uh, an upper and lower bound for the, for the length. The upper, the upper bound is easy by the energy and the lower bound is done uh, by applying this Fenchel theorem. So I want to stress the fact that here, I really have to use the integral of K with the modulus. I cannot use directly Gauss-Bonnet because I'm considering immersion. So there are really cases in which the curvature is zero. Think for example, a very simple uh, symmetric figure eight. So here the modulus has to stay. Okay, and so combining all these things, I get a lower bound for the energy. And uh, I can show uh, existence of minimizer directly fulfilling the lower bound. So I can find an object that satisfies the lower bound with the minimizer. So I skip this part because uh, I, I'm out, I don't have so much time, but basically in the case when we have constraint to show the existence of minimizer, it's an easy argument with uh, that method in the calculus variation. So I've already shown a lot of lower bound. One can find also very easily upper bounds. Compactness is not an issue. And with the parameterization that I choose, also lower semi-continuity of the function is quite easy to see. Comes simply from the fact that basically we have the integral of um, gamma SS square plus things. Okay, so with a direct method, we can show existence in all cases, but I think it's nicer to see how one can show existence for the unconstrained problem, the case in which we don't fix the area and don't fix the length of the vector field. So in this case, I have this lower bound here energy is bigger equal than this. And I can find a object that has exactly this energy. And this object is very simple. It's a circle. So it's a circle with a certain radius, the one 
correct to have the equality in the other case. And the field is simply in normal direction and there's a particular length. So with this specific um, object, I, I found a, I satisfy the lower bound, so I found it nicer. So this is what we have. So why I show you before the regularity of critical point, I show you before the regularity of critical point because um, to find the minimizer here and show that it is unique, I need at least C2 ER because um, here I could have change of curvature, suddenly change of, uh, of a, of a sign of a curvature if I was not C2. And here I cannot remove the, the absolute value. So when I go uh, and see that I satisfy all the equality, I have to satisfy an equality here and the modulus has to stay here. And so to be sure that I'm regular enough, I have to be a little, a little C2. Okay, so to conclude, the unconstrained problem, uh, there is no need of direct method. And also we have found a unique minimizer and the minimizer is embedded. So in the case of the unconstrained problem, we have perfect equivalence with our original geometric problem. For this reason, since we have equivalence, it's easy to study my problem, not the one in the embedded case. I end up with a result that I wanted. And so I've done. Instead, when I work with a constraint problem, it's much more difficult to find objects that satisfy the lower bound that I can obtain. Because I have also to find something that satisfies the area constraint, the constraint on the vector field, so it's much more harder. So in that case, it's not so easy to find a unique minimizer and the fact that it's embedding. We don't even know if a minimizer is embedded. Indeed, when embedding, the embeddedness is not preserved along, along the minimizing sequence. I think this is one of the main issues of this problem that makes the problem really non-trivial. Is the fact that we can end up, also if we start with something that it is embedded, we can end up with something that has some touching. So the only thing that we can do, because this is not avoidable, is to relax the problem and to study the, rel the relax relaxation problem. So the one that uh, the problem that uh, admit also this kind of touching with our um, transversal trans trans transversal trans touching. Tangential are not allowed. So one cannot go from here to here. And the question that remain open that I think is particularly interesting, also if we don't have a vector field, also if we consider simply the integral of kappa square is this one. Uh, if one can characterize the smallest compact set of immersion, only immersion, in which the class of embedding is dense in energy. I think it's a good point to start to stop. I thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you, Alessandra, for this nice talk. Uh, are there any questions uh, here? Do you have to come to the mic? Thank you. Thanks for the talk. I have two questions. So the first is about general, uh, general question about the problem. So uh, do you know, or is it easy to see, for instance, for surfaces, the sphere that some configuration are the minimizer or the torus, for instance? Okay, I think that this is not such an easy question. So maybe it's find critical point, it's something, but show that the minimizer is much harder. So we have not tried yet to study the higher dimensional problem, it's something we surely want to study, but maybe you know better than me which are the difficulty involved when there is Wilmore. <laughs> so okay. it's not trivial. Okay, so already the shape of, uh, so you, ca you cannot guess for a torus, for instance, that you have a... One can try something with numerics, okay. but I don't have anything analytic. And another question. So did you manage to see, or is it easy to see, when you have a short time existence, uh, when it stops existing in uh, the time? You have okay, energy no. concentrate? Or, it's, or... it's clear the question, so, okay. okay. So we have a partial result in this, in this direction that I hope can be definitely improved. So we have, at the moment, we are still finishing the things. So it's really on, in progress. We have focused on the stability result, but at least in the case of curves, we already have a block criterion result, but I don't know if it is optimal. So what, what one can show is that if um, some nor, L2 norm of 
things involving curvature is bounded, then you have a, a global existence. So you have really a local description. So the, vector, the vector field doesn't play any, doesn't the, add any more. He had a lot of difficulties. This is the problem because um, so we uh, are fourth order, so we don't have any maximum principle. So to show this kind of blob criterion or global existence, I have to um, use um, integral estimate. At least I have, don't have boundaries, so it's not super bad. But clearly, when you try to do the integral estimate, you have to estimate something that um, usually is going to be with curvature, but in this case, it's going to be this object here. So you see, so when, when you try to do this estimate, much more terms appear. Maybe you can call this y, I don't know, and study this y term here. But still, it's not so, so easy to see. Even uh, so, I, I've done this partially for curves. I don't even know if it's the best result possible, the blob criterion. Because if there, there is no vector field, you have global existence because it's basically Wilmer. So I'm still working on it. It's a very interesting question. There are, are there questions from uh, remote? No. So no, just a curiosity about uh, your um, equations. Uh, the equation for eta, if you apply the divergence, uh, is this uh, more enlightening? In this case here? No, no, in, at the beginning. Here. Here, take the divergence and you have an equation for the divergence of eta. So we try also something similar because we wanted to be inside some linear theory, but the fact that they scale differently really is not helpful, but we have tried something like this. And because it seems more a kind of heat equation for the divergence of eta. Perhaps, but of course there is the coupling. Uh, the because yes, when there is the other term, so we try to see if we can fulfill Solonikov theory for system, but does not fulfill, even if you apply divergence. So we try this. Okay, so let's thank again, uh, Alessandra. Thank you. Okay, so okay. let's... Uh, um, Continue. Our second speaker is uh, Marco Carocia from Polytechnic of Milano. He will talk about contact surface of Chigger sets. Thank you very much. And uh, let me thank Berardo, Matteo, and Mikhail for the perseverance they had in trying to organize this conference and for, for succeeded and for inviting me to. I'm particularly happy to present this, uh, this work in uh, this conference because it's, uh, it's a joint work with uh, Simone Ciani, and it has been entirely developed during the lockdown. So it's particularly significant for me to present it here, which is uh, live for the first time. So what I'm gonna talk to you about is uh, uh, about the minimizer of this object here, which are called typically Chigger set. So the Chigger constant is uh, the minimum actually is defined as an infimum and it becomes a minimum of uh, among all subset of omega of the ratio between the perimeter and the volume. So any and any set, any subset of omega which attains this ratio here is called a Chigger set for or of omega. This it depends on what kind of what kind of literature you're looking at. So the application of this object, it's it's wide in literature. Just to mention one, one of the uh, uncountable ones. Uh, you can use it to bound from below the P Laplacian eigenvalue, the first Dirichlet P Laplacian eigenvalue, or you can see it as the, as the limit as P goes to one. Okay, so this is a very partial list of literature. And I, I'll leave at the end of the talk a slide with all the selected literature I had, uh, I had uh, selected for this talk. Okay, so these are the guys. Let's see some examples immediately just to just to recall. I'm, I'm sure that half the audience here is, is really quite confident with these uh, notions, but I'm going to recall them no matter what. So, and let's put some terminology. I call, I will call free boundary the part of the Chigger set, which is, in, is the set in red, that lives inside the ambient space. And then I'm going to call contact surface the part which sticks to the boundary of the ambient space. So, in this picture, the black box. Here is the is the ambient space omega, and then a red, the red set is a, is a chigger set. Okay, so let's see some more examples. You can see this guy will try to fill not always all the space he has because if the angle is too steep, there is not much convenience in entering in these uh, in these angles. 
But you can also have a situation where the trigger set feels almost completely the ambient, feels completely the ambient space. Okay, so this is a nice point to do this remark. If the only set which has a ball as a trigger set is the ball itself. So if you have a trigger set which that you know is a, being a ball, then this means that your ambient space is a ball as well. Uh, careful that the, the ball is not the only set whose trigger set is filling entirely the ambient space. You can provide other example of trigger sets that fill the ambient space. But if you are a ball, then the ambient space is a ball. Okay, these are just to set some basic terminology. Now, the plan of my talk is now the following one. I'm gonna recall you some known properties of the trigger set, just the one I need to develop my argument. Because as I, as I said, the literature is white. So I've been selecting a few of them. Then I'm gonna focus on, uh, on the contact surface, which is the part that speaks on the boundary, because I would like to give some bound on the dimension, on how big it has to be. And then since the, the, the main theorem I'm gonna provide, it's a bit weird, I would like to prove to, to give you a sketch of the proof to, to, to somehow justify uh, what, it, what it appears in the theorem. And then I claim that these bounds are sharp, so I'll just provide you a, an example of the sharpness. Okay, let's do first easy existence and interior regularity. So the first thing we, we set down is that Given an open bound set, you always find at least one trigger set. Of course, this guy has to be bounded. Okay, this is a crucial ingredient. And uh, moreover, you have an internal regularity property. So you have that uh, the free boundary is an analytic hypersurface with constant mean curvature computable equal to h of omega, where h is actually the trigger constant. And this is some sort of interior regularity. Just a quick remark, uh, I stay, I'm stating this assertion in dimension two, but this statement is actually true in dimension, in general dimension. It's just that this second statement takes a slightly different form because if the dimension is too big, a singular set might appear that, you, that needs to be somehow excluded from this interior regularity. So what I'm saying is that provided you are in low dimension, this is true in this, in this way. If you go, on a dimension which is too high, you need to, to get a slightly different version of this statement that I'm not gonna talk about. But the statement I'm gonna give later on are actually true in general dimension. It's just that I'm kind of hiding this technical point. Okay, now I'm gonna give you also some boundary regularity in picture because it's easier. So as I say, this is a free boundary. So as you can see, this is just a circular arc with constant mean curvature. If you go around a contact point here and you put yourself in coordinate and you represent the profile uh, of the trigger set and the profile of the ambient space, then what you have is the first thing is that the trigger set meets the ambient space only in a tangential way. So no corner of any kind, just it, it, it's convenient to be flat. So you always have flat part here. The second thing is that there is some regularity which is transmitted from the oops from the ambient space to the trigger set. So if the ambient space is C1, for instance, then the, the trigger set will be locally C1. If the ambient space is C11, then you transmit the C11 regularity also to the trigger set. And also, okay, okay, if omega is convex, then you can actually transmit the C11 regularity. Okay. Just to give you an idea of how wide is the literature, just I'll just reporting this statement in the in a mathematical framework. And these are the references. You can see there are results that goes from 71 up to a most recent one to due to um, Fratelli and Leonardi from 2016, which are like this boundary regularity, I think. Okay, so uh, let's recap that. So you have this example and this boundary regularity. Now you look at this example and you kind of feel that there is some desired regularity property which seems to be missing, which is this one here. So you're tempted to say that the contact surface between the trigger set and the ambient space, it's always D minus one dimensional, or at least it seems to be so. And you would like to like infer if this is actually the case or not. Uh, the reason why would you like to to infer this, it's for instance, because this is giving you some information as about the limit of the Neumann derivative of the prestige function. Because you can interpret this quantity in some sense as this limit. 
for instance, or just because it seems to be like a desirable regularity property you would like to add to this list. So you think about it a little bit and then you cook up this guy, which is kind of violating your conjecture. So this is a, it is as a contact surface, which is just six point. Right? So this is a nice trigger set. This is a nice ambient space and they touch just in this six point. So you do, you do change your statement. You say, okay, this is maybe gonna happen in some cases. So you, you wanna wonder what is going on, right? Because the, what it seems to, to be required to violate these properties that you have to break regularity, all right? So, and that's exactly what is gonna happen. And uh, I think I, I'm gonna give you the statement later where the, the regularity is actually indeed linked to the dimension of this, uh, of this uh, contact surface. But first, let me give you an easy bound. Why we ex you would like to, to have at least one point inside there, or at least to say that the, the contact surface is not empty at least. And this is the case, and the, the reason is that basically the ratio between the perimeter and the volume, it scales in favor of the volume. So if you, for instance, have a trigger set, which has no contact with its ambient space, then you could actually dilate it a little bit and violate the minimality by exploiting this, uh, this, uh, this scaling factor. So you, you, you have at least one point in the contact surface. I'm gonna push this argument a little bit further and say, okay, I think you, you need to have at least two points because if you have just one point, I'm gonna detach it and I'm gonna go back to the previous case. So you have at least two points in the contact. Now, how much I can push this argument? I, not that far, right? So I'll need a, 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 deeper, a deeper one if I wanna understand better the, the size of this guy. So what we did with Simone is uh, that we provide this theorem which has this weird link between the regularity and the house of dimension. And the theorem is the following one. I mean, if you have the ambient space, boundary of omega, with regularity of plus C1 alpha, then you need to have the D minus two plus alpha house of measure positive of the contact surface. And okay, this is like uh, in the case alpha equals zero, you can actually say that this has to be actually plus infinity, not just positive. And not, not, not just that, if you are in the plane for any alpha in zero one, you can build an open bounded set omega, which has a trigger set and the contact surface satisfying exactly the fact that they have alpha house of dimension of the contact, uh, of the contact surface and uh, the ambient space is one alpha. So this bound seems to be at least in the plane actually sharp, you cannot do better. So I say that there is a weird thing in this theorem, which, which appears, I think I felt it, it's, it's weird. It, it's, it, there is this alpha which moves from the regularity of the profile up to the house of dimension. It's kind of move, right? And uh, okay, the, the point is that this has to deal with the removable singularity tools that I'm gonna show you in the, in the proof. So that's why I'm gonna show you uh, the proof in a second. Yeah. Uh, no, here it's, yeah. One. One. Up here. And uh, that's actually plus infinity there, the D minus two out of dimension. And uh, yeah, that's okay. Maybe that would be better without. Okay. Uh, just a warning before we proceed is that this statement is locally false. I mean, what I mean with that is that this has to be a global bound, not a, a local bound. Indeed, you can locally violate this, uh, this statement in the following sense. Take a trigger set like this, and uh, you have possibly C infinity bound around the space. Then you start to wriggle locally the ambient space in the, in, from inside. Now you can show that this operation does not affect neither the trigger constant nor the trigger set up to some extent. So this means that this guy will remain a trigger set of the, of, of the wriggled ambient space. But you can actually immediately see that you can like provide a very bad contact set here. So what you need is a global argument that tells you that somewhere there should be this dimension, but maybe somewhere else you will have phenomena like this. You can actually put a counter set of contact surface here, which is gonna be like as bad as you want. Okay, so let's see the strategy of the proof. So this, the, the idea is the following one. You put yourself, you choose a, you choose a contact point. You pick a point in the, in the contact surface. You assume first that your ambient space is not a ball. And this is a crucial point that you'll see later, but it's a very important ingredient. 
So let's put the ball aside for, for a second. Then you pick a point in the contact surface, which exists because I just show you that you need to have at least one. So I'll take that one possibly. And I put myself in, uh, in graph, in graph coordinate. And then I just represent this. Okay, from now on, I'm gonna call gamma the pre-image of the contact surface in local coordinate. If you, if you put yourself in, in, in uh, graph coordinate, you will have a part where your profile has constant mean curvature up here, and then a part where your profile is sticking to the ambient space. I'm gonna call gamma the part that lives on the RD minus one and D minus gamma the, 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 other, the other part. So the key point is that on the, on the part where you have a free boundary, your profile is solving the constant mean curvature equation. And you also know that this guy has to be H because that's, uh, that's the stationary condition that comes from the regularity property. Okay, so if the situation is like this, so if your contact surface is already big, you have to deal with it. There's not much you can do. But we are interested in showing that it cannot be small. So if it's small, for instance, if it's a point, it's a very easy question. This is a very easy case, right? Because if it's a point, I'm regular on the right, I'm regular on the left, I'm regular in the contact point because the, the boundary is at least C1. So this forces this arc to basically glue very nicely here. So this means that uh, the profile is solving the constant mean curvature equation on the right, on the left, and actually on the full D, because I'm going to extend it also on gamma, right? So the idea is, okay, if, if gamma is too small, so small that I can basically remove it from the constant mean curvature equation, then I can start to do this game. So I take a small contact surface. I remove it from the constant mean curvature equation. Then I conclude that my Chigger set will have a constant mean curvature equation in that small cube, which I'm looking at. And then I recall, okay, if I assume that the contact surface is globally small, then I can repeat this argument around any contact point. So I'm gonna deduce that around any contact point, I will have constant mean curvature. But then I recall that the free boundary also had constant mean curvature. So, I find out that I'm basically having custom mean curvature all around, right? But this means that I can invoke Alexandrov theorem and deduce that E is a ball, right? Okay, almost, because I need to remember that there was this small set sigma, which was acting as a singular set. And that's why I need the revised version of Alexandrov's theorem, which has just been developed by the Gadino and Maggi in 2019, in which accounts for also this uh, particular problematic set. But that's it. I mean, okay, it's fine. You get that E is a ball. And then if E is a ball, then recall what I said at the very beginning. If you have a trigger set, which is a ball, then the ambient space, it's, it's a ball. So omega must be a ball. But I just told you, just let's forget about the ball. Let's pretend omega is not a ball. So I got a contradiction, basically. So this means that the contact surface cannot be small. Because I, if, whenever it's small, I'm going to like do this, right? Okay, so how much how much small can you be at least you need it to be at least as big as it is required for this implication to fail so if i want to find bound on the dimension of the contact surface i have to dig down into this removable singularity problem how big can a set gamma be in order for this implication to fail okay now now maybe i can convince you that this problem it starts to link the regularity of this function with the size of this set. And that's where the regularity is transmitted from the function to the set. And it's actually, if you take an extreme case, for instance, take the two is C2. If you is C2 on the full D, then a negligible gamma can be removed because you can extend, basically the, the derivative is continuous, so you can extend this also on gamma. So the more regular is U, the, the bigger the set gamma can be. Unfortunately, you cannot count on a function u which is better than C11 because that, that, that's the regularity of the Chigger set profile. You cannot go after that. Okay, so let's see. Uh, with one of them, we started to look at the removable singularity tools, uh, which are basically these. Uh, these uh, wait, 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 wait. Gamma is, is called the removable singularity if uh, whenever you have a solution in some class, then actually you can extend the PD also to be in some sense, either weak or strong. And actually, of course, the removability is, is, is related to the regularity of you. 
Uh, this is also a very, a very huge uh, topic in literature. We've selected just few, very, very few results, but it's a, it's a very big topic. Okay, so uh, let's see, for instance, this is the, that's the first theorem on, on removable singularities when it comes to quantum equivalent equation is the, the George Stampacchia Simon theorem. This theorem has been proved by the George Stampacchia and then later it has been a little, a little bit uh, uh, improved by Simon. So it's also called the George Stampacchia Simon. And it tells you the following thing. Suppose you have a U which is C2 on D minus gamma. So you have information outside of gamma and you know that your function u solves the constant mean equivalent equation on d minus gamma. Uh, okay, let's let me clarify this. D prime now you should imagine that is d minus one because I'm looking at the Chigger set and the ambient space as a graph of a function from d minus one into r. So for state this uh, this assertion I'm using d prime, but uh, you can you have to make that d prime is actually d minus. So what the George Stampak and Simon tells you is that if you solve the constant mean equivalent equation outside of gamma and you are C2 outside of gamma and the size of gamma is d prime minus one negligible with respect to the out of measure, then you can extend U to a U tilde uniquely in a way that this U tilde also solve the constant mean equivalent equation to the full U. Okay. Actually, the theorem involves the one capacity. So I'm gonna state this with, uh, with the out of dimension just to keep the, the notation consistent but it's a bit more general than that. Okay, so now I have a particular, I have a quantitative way to say how much small I had to be. Okay, so let's rerun the argument I told you before. So I'm gonna show you how this quantitative uh, information on the removable singularity can be translated into a theorem on contact circuit. So you suppose that omega is not the ball and then you make an assumption on the, on the how small is the contact circuit. So pretend that this is small in the following sense. So the D minus two hours of dimension of the contact surface is zero. Then, okay, let's pretend that the boundary of omega is at least one. Fine. You pick a contact point. As I said, you, you use D prime to be D minus one. And then you, you basically transmit this information to, to H D prime minus one of gamma by exploiting basically the fact that you have a diffeomorphism between the R D minus one and the, your, your surface. So since D minus one is D prime, then this actually is, it's consistent. So being negligible at the D minus two level on the surface, it means to be negligible at the D prime minus one level on the, on the flat plate. Now, as I said you before, okay, you have uh, a function f of e which solves the constant mean equivalent equation outside of gamma. You have the negligibility of gamma with respect to the right dimension. Then you apply and invoke the, the George Stampacchia Simon theorem and you, can, and you extend the constant mean equivalent equation to the full space. And then you run the argument as before. You do it on every contact point and then you, you invoke the Alexandrov theorem revised and you conclude that the omega e was a ball and this omega was a ball. And that's a contradiction. So either this is true or this is true. So this has to be false, basically. Right? So this is, it has to, it has to hold that H minus two has the positive. Okay, but I promised you, not this, but I promised you H D minus two plus alpha. So I promised you a little bit more. So to, to improve this, well, basically I have to improve this. So I need to find some more refined removable singularity too. And that's actually Pokrovsky's theorem which exploit the fact that you has to be a little, if, if you allow yourself to get some more regularity on the full D, so if you remember that the George Stampakia Simon theorem exploit information only on D minus gamma. What Pokrovsky is telling you, okay, but if you allow yourself to be, to know some more regularity of you on the full D, let's say C1 alpha to do the full space also on gamma then, then you could actually enlarge this, uh, this singularity set. You can remove a bitter one, a, a, a bigger one. So what it tells you is that if you have a C2 function outside of gamma, which is C1 alpha on D, and it solves the constant equivalent equation, then you can remove set which has D prime minus one plus alpha. Out of the measure. And, and that's where this regularity moves from, this alpha moves from here to, to, to the side of the gamma. Okay, uh, this principle actually, it's quite nice because it applies to all the elliptic equation in divergence form. Indeed, Pokrovsky has proved it for the constant mean equivalent equation, then lately for the pre-Laplacian equation, and then finally, generally for the uniformly elliptic equation. 
tablet and so on. So it's, it's a general property, this trade-off, okay? So starting from a function which has C1 alpha regularity and C2 regularity outside of gamma, which solve an elliptic equation, allows you to extend the elliptic equation also on gamma, provided that, that gamma has this, uh, this dimension. The nice thing we discovered with Simona is that this is actually a consequence, not of the elliptic uh, equation structure, but it's actually a consequence of the distributional divergence. So this is a true in general for vector field, which are C alpha, and which has distributional divergence well-defined outside of set gamma, which is small in, with respect to this alpha. Okay, so with this observation, you can actually recover Pokrovsky's theorem and all, all, all the consequences. And it's actually, I think it's interesting, it's interesting to see that it come, all it comes down to the divergence, actually. And you don't need the, the, the PD structure that actually Pokrovsky is using to, to prove the, the theorem. But okay, I think now I convinced you with the first trial that in this second trial, I'm gonna get this theorem because I'm gonna start from omega, which is not a ball. I'm gonna suppose now that the contact surface has these sides with this improved quantitative statement. And then I'm gonna rerun exactly the same argument. Okay, the only thing I'm missing with respect to, to the first scenario is that I need to deduce that F of E is also C1 alpha. But this comes, and that's where it comes into the game that boundary omega needs to be C1 alpha. This comes from the regularity of the, of the boundary of omega. So the regularity of the boundary of omega implies the regularity of the boundary of E around contact point. And then you can actually move this property to this guy uh, according to the same principle. And then you basically conclude the same thing. So if you solve the constant incubator equation outside of gamma and you have this whole property, you can extend. And that is it. Okay, so uh, finally, the last uh, I think 20 minutes, I'll try to give you uh, some, some more detail about this sharp example. So what you can do is that actually you can cook up uh, a, a set, an open bounded set, which has a trigger set, uh, but that the contact surface actually saturate the bounds in the plane, okay? So this means that basically these, uh, these bounds are actually quite sharp at least in the plane. Okay, so how do you do that? You still go looking in where the removable singularity tool fails. So you want to build some set such that outside of this set, the equation is, is, is failing and you cannot extend it. So what you do is that you, you start from a counter type construction because that's what allows you to have this, this alpha out of dimension positive. And this can be done for any alpha between zero and one, you can cook up. You can cook up one, and then you you start cooking up the this sort of counter staircase function integrated suitably. If you, if you do this, then you derive it in the right way. Then you you discover that this function is it's, it's solving the constant incubator equation outside this counter set, actually partially iterated. The good news is that if you iterate this construction with respect to n, you you end up with the set gamma, which is basically a counter type set, and the function u, which is solving this equation outside of gamma. And it's gonna look like basically these guys. So you are gonna have this dusty, this dusty set here where the constant mean curvature breaks. And then you're gonna have this circular arc where you have constant mean curvature always equal to h, so always the same. And it's, uh, this profile is C1 alpha. So you can break the curvature condition by, by remaining C1 alpha. Okay, so now you have this nice candidate. I'm gonna use it to cook up this sort of like weird thing. And how you do that in the following way. You start, you take this profile and you glue it, let's say in four direction, one, two, three, and four. And then you, you junction them uh, by using this, uh, this circular arc with the right curvature. And you can glue them because uh, this profile has also the good taste of having the zero derivative on the right and on the left. So it's actually quite good to together. So now what, what's missed? So you have to build the ambient space and you know that the ambient space will have a free bound. So this, 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 if this pretends to be the trigger set of this guy here, this guy here better be the free boundary, right? It has to be the free boundary. So what I'm gonna do is that the touching part needs to be this dusty guy here and the free boundary will be 
everything else which is outside. So I'm going to push the ambient space out just in those places where the constant Minkowitz equation is solved. And then I, I'd like to prove that uh, the red set is the Chigger set of the black set. Because if, if I do this, then I'm, I'm done because the contact surface is by construction alpha dimensional with respect to the output measure because it's the counter set lifted up to the surface. And to do this, we make use of a, of a purely primary instrument that has been developed by Leonardo Saracco and Leonardo Saracco and Neumeyer. And that allows you to basically test when you have a Chigger set of some, someone else. So it's, it's some sort of practical tools that allows you to test if something is a Chigger set of something else. And this is actually, to the best of our knowledge, there is no counterpart in, in bigger dimensions so far. And that's quite of a crucial thing. And that is why we, you cannot, I, we were not able to provide sharp example in, in bigger dimensions. So, uh, okay, I think I'm gonna finish a little bit earlier, but it's fine. Let's do some final consideration. Uh, the first thing is that we think that these bounds are sharp also in bigger dimension due to the, like the sharpness of, due to the argument of removable singularities. The problem with building this, this counter example relies mostly in the fact that you, you don't have, you have to find basically solution to the constant incubator equation, which fails to be extended right on that gamma. And moreover, this solution needs to have the required geometric properties to, to be surged together in order to make a set. And this is the first thing we did. It, it seems to be not easy to find out in bigger dimension. The second, you would need some instrument that allows you to prove once you have a candidate that you're really looking to a trigger set of somebody. So basically you would need the counterpart of this guy in bigger dimension, some sort of test that allows you to show that the red set is indeed the trigger set of the black set. So these two things seems to be missing so far. And that is why we were not able to, to extend this, this proof. Uh, some more consideration is that uh, this argument, the whole argument on the removable singularity is actually quite sensible more to the regularity of the boundary of E than to the regularity of the boundary of omega. This means that I can rephrase the, the statement by saying that if the trigger set is C1 alpha, then the contact surface has to be at least HD minus one plus alpha dimension. This means that, for instance, in the convex case, where you can infer C11 regularity of the, of the boundary of E without knowing some, the C11 regularity of the, of the convex ambient space, you can still deduce that uh, the D minus one dimensional out of measure of the contact surface has to be positive in the convex case. And the second thing we would like to, to have is that if you are convex, if, you are, if your ambient space is convex, this seems to be forbidden, right? So what seems to be reasonable is that in the convex case, either you have empty, if, if you choose an open bounded set, if you look locally, lo locally, either you don't see the contact surface or you see the D, a D minus one dimensional contact surface. So you can never see locally behavior like that, which can be stated in this way. And this is also a conjecture we even, and okay, I think uh, these are the last, uh, this is the last slide where I, I'm going to leave the, the literature I, I've been using to prepare the talk and uh, the, most in, the, the most part of the ingredients in the, in the paper. And I think I'm going to finish a little bit earlier. So I'm going to thank you for your for, for attention. <laughs> I'm gonna leave. Thank you for this interesting talk. Are there any questions? Uh, first of all, thanks for the very nice presentation, uh, Marco. And just a curiosity, I was wondering if in the technique that uses the, um, the removability theorem that you have mentioned, uh, there is a, maybe a, a possibility of uh, doing something like uh, maybe in using viscosity. So if, because uh, so the idea maybe could be that you say lower the, the, the mean curvature, you find the solution for a lower uh, value and then get some uh, a priori estimate on the solution so that you, you might recover the, 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 
the limit uh, and the regularity on, on the limit and the fact that if you had uh, say some larger contacts maybe i don't know maybe i I don't know actually. That's a good question. Maybe, maybe you'll be talking maybe it's about okay. it. Thank you. Any other question? The question actually depends on whether I understood some other result. In dimension two, if you have a C11 boundary, then how large can be the, the C minus one? One. One. So it has positive length. Right. Now, question Globally. is. Yeah. Okay. So the question is. Do you have, can you say something about how large is this measure related to, um, let's say the curvature, the bound on the curvature of the, of the curve? So we have a curve, uh -huh. the boundaries uh, of the ambient space as a curve. I guess I would expect that if it has low curvature, very flat, somehow the contact set ah, must be very large. That's interesting. Yeah, I would like. I wish I had something like that, but I. It I, doesn't come from this type of. Proof. I maybe, but it's it's not obvious to me how to derive this uh, this uh, this thing from from this argument. Maybe it, but I, I don't know if it's actually I'm not sure how to derive it. But it's actually an interesting point. I wish I I could answer to that. Okay, then uh, the second question is. So at some moment you said that if you have only something piecewise C one, you can have only contact points might happen yeah. and that's small but that's small if you decide to consider to, to measure points just without of measure which may be not so natural somehow these points yeah they are six in your mm -hmm. example and there are very few but they are somehow points which are very exposed of the boundary right uh, in the sense let's say that there are a lot of points in the interior for which that's the closest point in the boundary yeah that's true okay and so one might think that a different geometric Point. measure of sets might say that in some sense, yeah, these are six, but are not few because in some sense they have to be, let's say, if you think in terms of how exposed they are, they have to be large. And they are charging a lot of curvature in some sense. Well, uh, in a negative, yeah, okay. exactly. Uh, and okay. That's, that's right. So maybe that's the possibility and doesn't come, nothing like this comes from your uh, not that I can see it, because that's actually really comes from everything comes from the constant in equation equation and like that 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 kind of theory there. So, but really, on those points, there is Dirac masses in terms right. Of yeah, that's it. That, uh, that's true. That, so probably, like in the major theoretic sense, they are not. Uh, I mean, if you if you look at the curvature as a measure, they are they, they are charging indeed. Uh, non-trivial way so yes i agree more questions any question from uh, remote no so if not thank again uh, marco now there is a coffee break and we resume at uh, I think 1130, 1130. Um, so next talk is online talk by Antoine uh, Le Menon, who we talk about uh, uh, C1 regularity for the planar Griffith energy. Antoine, Antoine. Yes, yes, can you hear me? Yes, Wait. Okay. yes, very good. So please, it's up to you. Thank, thank you very much. So first of all, I would like to not only thank the organizer, but uh, congratulate the organizers to have uh, successfully organized this conference at the end. Uh, of course, I would, uh, I would prefer to come to Pisa, but it was too complicated for me. So I will talk about this uh, result that we have some time ago with uh, Jean-Francois and Flaviana Irlano about regularity for the Griffith minimizers. And then uh, some recent uh, small improvements that we did with Camille Laboury recently. OK, so uh, since the Griffith energy is very uh, similar to the Mancorcha uh, problem, which is a very, very classical problem, I will uh, review some classical stuff about the Mancorcha uh, functional. Uh, I will be quick, but uh, still, uh, 
still uh, we come back to this functional so i apologize if you already know perfectly well this functional so this functional is um, a very famous uh, functional that arise in well in three discontinuity uh, problems uh, originally it was uh, stated uh, to solve uh, image segmentation uh, problem so an image is a let's say a bounded function and you want to find in the image the, the edges of the image so you have uh, your function g is is the is the image uh, no so it's the gray, gray level of the of the image and you want to find the edges which means that the, the 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 set here the edges is the set where the image uh, have a jump so it's a functional that will detect the jump of a function by a minimization process so you minimize among couples uh, u and k k is a closed set which is the candidate of being the edges of the image here so it's your set k that you are looking for and u is a function which is regular more regular or defined outside this set so h1 here is the serverless space and then mumford and sharp proposed to minimize this functional with two terms so the length of the set k which is in competition with the Dirac energy outside k this is a very famous uh, uh, mumford sharp functional and then you have a term which is called here the fidelity term which is like uh, let's say like a Dirichlet datum or some datum because it's the image it's of lower importance in terms of regularity and existence for this function. Okay, so you minimize the, 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 the among all couples this functional and the classical questions that we ask is existence and regularity of, uh, of minimizers. Um, uh, so the, 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 the classical strategy is to relax the functional in the SBV space. And there we, we talk about weak existence. So weak existence is the existence in the SBV space. So we, I will not recall exactly what is SBV, but it's, it's a space which is very uh, convenient for, 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 for free discontinuity problem. It's like, a, let's say, the distributional uh, version of uh, of your of your problem here so this is why they, they call weak existence and it turns out that in the spv space the the existence is uh, is okay so you have compactness and semi-continuity so you can find so you replace the set k instead of having k and u which are completely independent each other here the set k is the singular set of your function u which is sbv so now the functional have only one variable which is u and you minimize on, on this space as we okay <clears throat> and then there is a strong existence so what we call strong existence is the the fact that actually when you minimize on this uh, space sbv the singular set of a minimizer is uh, essentially closed which means that the surface uh, of the of the adherence minus the, the the set itself has measure zero um Okay, so this, this statement tells you that actually there exists a strong minimizer, which means that the, the problem originally stated here on closed set has, has a minimizer. Um, the key point here, I mean, a byproduct of this strong existence is usually you get some, you need to prove some density lower bound. So when you have a density lower bound, you, you get this estimates on the, on the Osdorf measure of the adherence. And this, uh, okay, it, <clears throat> as a byproduct of this strong existence, you usually have some uh, Alport regularity estimates, which is the uh, uniform bound on the density from above and from below of your set. This theorem was uh, was proved uh, very just after the statement of the of the, of the Mumford-Sharp functional. So. The, a very short time and it uses the point carré in SBV which is based on the coherea formula uh, alternatively there are other groups of people that also have existence strong existence directly without using SBV um, all this stuff so it's not a strategy but also they use the coherea formula okay uh, this is for existence so at least there exist minimizers and then there is the regularity and the functional is famous because of this conjecture. So for the, 
which is still open. So if you in, in dimension two, I forgot to say that in higher dimension, you have the surface n minus one here on the singular set. Um, so in dimension two, the set K, so the minimizer should be a finite union of C1 arcs. And well, this is still open today, but there are, uh, there are some partial results which are very famous. So I, I state this statement. So <clears throat> if you take a minimizer, then there exists, a, let's say, a, a singular set sigma in your set K of Osdorff dimension strictly less than n minus one, so that in the complement you are locally C1 alpha. Uh, okay, so there are several uh, proof of that. But okay, so there is a, a first proof that I mentioned here is in dimension two in uh, 1986 of, the, of David, he proved, uh, he proved this statement, exactly this statement in dimension two, with those of dimension, the estimate on those of dimension also in, in this paper. Uh, then in higher dimension, there is the, the result of Ambrosio, Fusco, and Palara that you can find in their book. Um, for the epsilon regularity, which says, let's say that it's C1 almost everywhere. And if you want to, to have uh, the, the estimate on the Osdorff dimension, then you, there is a paper by Rigo, which is based on uniform rectifiability uh, estimates, which was proven earlier by David and Sams. Um, alternatively, you can also find a proof of the same uh, ambrosio fusco palara result, but completely different proof in my thesis uh, was done a long time ago. So you can replace this by, well, it, it, it was not written, it was written only in dimension three, but in, uh, with minimal cones. So, but if you take the, the minimal cone, which is a plane, it, it works in any dimension, and then you can have an, another alternative proof of Ambrosio Fusco Palara if you want. Uh, for the estimate on the other dimension, there are alternative also alternative ways to, to find this estimate. And there is this famous uh, Ambrosio Fusco Hutchinson. Uh, paper that which relates the higher integrability of the gradient with the other dimension of the singular set. So you can use this alternatively to, to estimate this, this other dimension. I will, uh, I will come back later on that. Alternatively, there is a new proof of Ambrosio Fusco Hutchinson uh, that was done by Delelis Focardin Ruffini, uh, which I think is one, one of the organizers of this conference, uh, that you can also use uh, to, to estimate the other dimension of, of the singular set. Okay, about this other dimension of the singular set, what we expect is n minus two uh, to have the Mumford Chuck conjecture because it's uh, you want a finite union of curves so that the singular set should be uh, dimension zero in in, in R two. Um, <clears throat> there is this uh, okay. The, the result I, I mentioned just just before is this one. So you can relate. So if you prove that the gradient is in LP because at the origin, you have a functional which is an uh, integral of gradient two square on omega minus k. So the gradient is only L2 uh, in omega because k has a uh, Lebesgue measure zero. So you, can, you know that gradient two is in L2. But if you can prove that globally the gradient is in LP with some p strictly larger than two, then you increase the, you, you get some information of the, about the other dimension of the, of the singular set. Actually, it was proven by uh, first by the list for in dimension two, but then by the Philippis and Figali that there exists really an exponent p which is strictly larger than two, so that the, uh, the gradient is in LP, which was actually related to a question of the Georgie because what we really expect we want we want the gradient to be in L. So if we want, um, for instance, for n equal two. For n equal to, we would like the gradient to be in L4, because then we will have uh, n minus two here, which is zero, and then we have the map of Chuck conjecture. Actually, this is wrong uh, because there is the crack tip, which is an example of a map of Chuck minimizer, which is not with gradients in L4. But in all the LP, p less than four, let's say it would be already a very good uh, result, but up to now we have LP with p. Uh, some p strictly larger than two. Okay. 
still in the regularity, the classical, this, let's say, standard theory of regularity for Monfortshire, you have this result of Bonnet, which works only in dimension two, which says that an isolated connected component of the singular set, which is a minimizer, satisfies the conjecture. So if you, and what, what is less known, but if you read carefully the theorem of Bonnet, you see that if you minimize among connected sets, then the conjecture is true. So what is difficult in the Manforcha is the, let's say, little piece of sets which are completely disconnected and very, uh, things like that. So this, this is difficult to, to control small pieces of sets. But if you have connected components, then it's, it's kind of regularity itself to be connected, and then you have the conjecture. There are two main ingredients on the, for this theorem. The first one is the monotonicity formula for the, the Dirichlet energy, which is a very, very nice uh, result because it says that connected is enough. So if you have K connected, then you have some monotonicity of the Dirichlet energy. But then you can proceed some blow up analysis and you have existence of blow ups, uh, which is the second main ingredient. And these are the two, two main ingredients. It's, it's not enough because the, the paper is very long and very, very smart. But uh, let's say these are two ingredients that you have to have to get this, that you need to get this result following the proof of Bonnet. Of course, all of this will fall down, uh, will not work for Griffey. This is why I, I do all this history is to, to try to, to explain, uh, uh, okay, that Griffey is, is completely different because you don't have monotonicity, you, so you cannot do blow ups. Uh, all the proofs that I mentioned here, the Ambrosio Fuscopalara is nobody up to now. Uh, I mean, it's not trivial to adapt the argument. There are very lot of problems on Griffith. But still, this is the picture for Memporcha. It was very quick, but uh, okay. If you if you are interested and you need references on Memporcha, you can read the famous book Ambrosio Fuscopalara, of course, the Guy David book. Uh, which is another one, very big book, 500 pages. There is another a review paper that I advertise uh, of myself uh, about the uh, Manforcha minimizer. So if you, if you want to have a look. Okay, so now the Griffith functional. So the Griffith functional is looks similar. It looks similar. So you have a function u, which is now vectorial valued. So from omega to, to, to R2. And uh, the energy is about the symmetric gradient. So you take, uh, so now the gradient is a matrix and you take the symmetric part of the, of the matrix and uh, it comes from elasticity, elasticity theory that this is a, a good energy that is used in elasticity. And then you, you do the same. So you have a competition between the Dirichlet or some energy outside the set K, which is closed and the length of the set K. So this is in dimension two, let's say. Uh, yes, I will do the, the rest of the talk in dimension two. Um, so why this function is because in, uh, in fracture theory, so in a brittle, a brittle fracture, you, the, the increase, the, uh, there are models uh, by physicists that says that we, to have a crack in, a, in an elastic body, uh, the, the, the energy to produce a crack is proportional to the length. And then this energy is very convenient to start the variational uh, formulation of crack propagation and it was, uh, made famous by Frankfurt and Margo, et cetera. So it's a function that arises in, in fracture theory. Uh, more precisely, you have a tensor here usually, so you don't have really this exact uh, norm square. So this is the norm of the matrix square, but you can have, of course, some tensor uh, like that, and then you have a scalar product like that, which is more relevant for applications. But I will discuss only the mathematical, uh, it's not a, not a big difference mathematically speaking for what I will say to take it just this energy. And now what I will call a Griffith, uh, what is a Griffith minimizer? So I don't have here plus U minus G like, like Manforcha. I, I, more, I prescribe some boundary datum J on, on the boundary of some omega. And I want U to match this J on the boundary of Dirichlet datum. And then I minimize this functional uh, with this constraint. This is a, what I will call a Griffith minimizer, okay? And I minimize among the same uh, space, so K closed and U 
uh, u should be in uh, I think it's LD of omega minus k. This means that the symmetric gradient is in L2 of omega minus k. Okay, so you, when you look to this functional, you say, well, it's very similar to my function. It looks like it's the same, etc. But actually, it's much more difficult. I will just emphasize some points which are difficult, uh, which produce some problems with this functional. Uh, because, of course, we ask for the same question. So, is there existence? Is there regularity of minimizers? Okay, so. The first problem is that you don't control the, the gradient, the full gradient of U. You control only in L2 the, the symmetric gradient. This uh, morally should not be a real problem because there is this very nice corn, point carry corn and corn inequalities that says that for a smooth domain, you can always control the full gradient by the elastic uh, energy, I mean, the symmetrical gradient. But this is only for a, this is only for a smooth domain, a priori. There is also this point carré corn. Point carré corn says that you can control the oscillation of u. So u minus a. A here is a rigid uh, movement. The rigid movement is uh, one that satisfies e of a equals zero. It's a symmetrical. Uh, it's a it's a affine function whose, gra whose gradient is symmetric matrix. Well. Uh, the problem is that we work in general in the in, in, in a domain of, of, the, of the type omega minus k, which is not smooth at all, and where you don't have those control, which uh, which provides a lot of problems, a lot of problems all the time. All the time. This is the, actually it's the main problem that you don't control this uh, the full gradient. So example of problem, you don't have, for instance, a Coera formula. So the Coera formula, it's a, I mean, this one, there are a lot of core, there are several core formulas, but the one I mentioned is this one, which says that you can recover the, the, the when you integrate the, 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 the area of the level set, you, you, can, uh, you can recover this by the total variation of u. Of course, there is no analog with E of u here. And so control of E of u is not enough to, to control the level set of, of u. Uh, well, you don't see now why this is important, but if you know a bit the theory the, on Memphorcha, on the classical scalar case, you see that this formula arises a lot of, in, in many places. And there is one, one place where you use the Coera formula. In particular, it is, it is present already in, a, it is present in, the, in, in the paper by David and Sams when they prove uniform rectifiability. I think this is one of the first time where uh, the Coera formula is, is used in this way that I will present now. Then it was, it was uh, so David Sems, they used this argument to prove uniform rectifiability, and it was also, also used by uh, Morel um, Dalmaso, Dalmaso Morel Solimini. They use it in their construction to have existence of a minimizer, a direct existence without using SBV. So they use this coherea in the following way. So the, the basic the basic situation is you have a ball where the singular set has some holes, and you want to fill the holes. And to fill the holes, you can um, you can take a level set of u. Uh, so you take a, well because of this because of this inequality, you can control you can find uh, oops. So you're in the situation, not only there, okay, you are in a situation where you know that K, let's say, is between two, two planes. And you know that the oscillation is small, uh, is large. You know that the average of U here uh, and the average of U here uh, ha, is uh, very, uh, very large. So this means that you should have some crack in the middle. And this, you can prove it by the Coera formula by selecting a level set. I, I wanted to, to change the color. Okay. You can find a level set here of U that will fill the holes and control the length of this level set by the, by the energy, by just uh, me or Chebyshev. And uh, okay, this, this type of arguments you cannot do anymore. This with the elastic energy and for Griffiths. Uh, to me, it's uh, 
now in the regularity for Griffiths is the, the main point. To, to, I mean, if someone has to find something really new and impressive on Griffiths, it has to, to, to find a procedure to fill the holes like that without using the coherent formula. Probably there is a way which is very uh, elementary by counting the number of lines that go through and integrating everything. I don't know, but uh, okay, I tried I tried some arguments in, in this direction, but it looks it seems to be difficult. Well, this is one problem that we have. Of course, if you work on connected sets, it's a bit easier because if you have a connected set, you don't have this difficulty of filling the holes. Uh, it is, well, it's not it's not immediate because of course you can have a, a connected set so that the intersection of with the ball uh, is not connected so here you have some holes but well when you are connected and you look at very small scales uh, you are rectifiable you, are, you have a lot of uh, properties that you can use especially you, you don't need to fill the holes Okay, uh, another big problem with E of U is the, 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 the behavior with composition. So if you compose uh, U and V and you take the symmetrical gradient, it behaves very badly. So you cannot do uh, Laurent Lagrange very easily because you don't control the terms. Uh, you cannot truncate. So you have very difficult problem to have uh, estimates like bounded estimates on a numerizer because the truncation procedure doesn't pass through the, the elastic energy. Uh, to define GSBV is difficult because GSBV is a space which is defined by composition. Uh, so, okay, for specialists, we, there are existence result in GSBV from the scalar case that you cannot mimic uh, for the Griffiths energy. There is no monotonicity formula. Okay, there are a lot of other problems uh, that, that, that we'll discuss later. Okay, still. Still, we can prove uh, existence. So we uh, existence have been proved. So firstly, weak existence. So we can weak. Say, uh, so you can mimic. Okay, start. We start now by doing the parallel between Mumford-Chain and Griffiths. So there is uh, the first result was uh, to relax the first the first strategy is to relax in SBV and prove existence in SBV the weak existence. So you can do the same and you produce a, a space which is BD, BD, the bonded deformation where the elastic, um, the, the, the gradient, the symmetrical gradient is, in, is a measure. And so this was uh, studied in, in this first paper. Then there is a semi-continuity and a compactness result uh, analog uh, in SBD. So you can prove existence in SBD, but, but, but you need a bound, of a left multi bound on U. Uh, to have that. And if you have the, the Griffiths problem that I mentioned, as I said, you cannot truncate, GSBD is difficult, etc. So you, it's difficult to, in practice, to, I think, to, to this, this is why later Dalmazo has proposed a new space, GSBD, uh, constructed by, by slicing. So he gave a, a definition, a convenient definition of a space which looks like SBD, SBD, a GSBD. Uh, actually, I think in the scalar case, this phi space is the same of the, the, GS, the standard GSBV. But uh, okay, so he can relax with this uh, theory of existence, uh, this a priori bound. He can he has a L1 bond, uniform bond instead of L infinity, so it's a bit better. And for instance, if you get you can have existence for the Griffiths functional. If you add U minus G as Mumford-Shaw, you get exist weak existence. But as you see, weak existence is already difficult to, to get. Um, recently, there is another very new result which says that actually you can uh, get rid of this term and you have real existence for the standard uh, Griffiths problem. Um, in GSBD, in the same space, you have existence. And it relies, uh, it uses as a, as a main tool. Um, the Poincaré corn inequality that was proved outside a small jump set by Chambord Cantier Francfort. So this is a tool which is coming on. So in, in the proof, in the in the De Giorgi Cariolacci proof, the, the standard one, they, they have this, they have this uh, Poincaré corn. So it says that if if you have a very small uh, jump set, then you can control uh, U minus uh, the average uh, by the 
<coughs> by the gradient of u. This is the scalar case. So they use the coherent formula to, to prove this, this type of, of inequality. And as here with Griffith, you don't have the coherent, you, you need some, some new techniques. And this was done in this paper. And this, with this tool, they, they were, Chambol and Chris Mal were able to prove existence uh, in GSBD. But all this is just for weak existence. Then there, are, there is strong existence. And uh, so this was also proved recently, very recently, Conti, Frank, Focardi, and Orlando in dimension two. Then Chambol, Conti, Orlando, they found in any dimension. As a byproduct of there, as I said, when you prove strong existence, usually you prove uh, the density lower bound. So a byproduct is that you have alpha regularity of the minimizer, which will be important for us in the next uh, in the sequence. So, okay, so up to now, we have existence, we have strong existence, and we have alpha regularity of our minimizer. Okay, now I present the statement, the main, uh, yeah, the main statement that I wanted to, to develop. So it's the, the following one. So um, take a Griffith minimizer in dimension two and take uh, L, a, a subset of, the, mini, of the, the singular set, which is an isolated connected component of K. Then this set will be C1 alpha almost everywhere. So if you compare to Bonnet, so this is only two dimensional. If you compare to Bonnet for the scalar case, uh, he proved that L uh, satisfies the, I mean, you can compare with Bonnet. Bonnet proved that if you have uh, an isolated connected component, then it satisfies the conjecture, the Manforcha conjecture in the scalar case. Here we take an isolated connected component and uh, it is uh, C1 alpha almost everywhere. Of course, it is difficult in general to control the number of connected components. It's not true that you will have, uh, uh, first of all, the, uh, uh, it's not true that you have a countable number of, uh, of connected components. So, so you cannot uh, sum up all the almost everywhere and have something globally on, on a singular set. But um, OK. Uh, it also works with connected constraints. So instead of uh, minimizing uh, globally, you minimize with the constraint of K being connected. And then uh, you will get that your singular set is C1 almost everywhere. Uh, okay. Also, another remark, once you have C1 alpha, you can go up to analytic and actually prove that you are analytic. Because here we minimize only the, the length and the, so the elastic energy plus the length. We don't have a, a J function here. So the regularity go up to, to analytic. This was proved by, uh, it uses some, uh, some famous results by Koch, Leoni, and Morini on Manforcha, but they, their theory is very general and applies to, to Griffiths to pass from C1 alpha to, to analytic. Um, okay, uh, further regularity. So this is the, the last uh, statement. So is uh, the fact that we can also do the same uh, thing as for the, the scalar case to improve the other dimension. So the other dimension is strictly less than one. And also we have the higher integrability of the gradient. So if you take an you take a, a isolated connected component, or is the same as minimizing on connected with connected constraint, take a neighborhood of, of, of this connected component, and then the, the the symmetrical gradient here will be in LP for some P strictly larger than can be. Okay, this is uh, less um, is less original. Let's say it really it relies on on, on standard technique. It, I will, I, will, I will tell you at the end how, how we do that. Um, okay, now I will develop uh, quickly the, the ideas of the proof of the main C1 alpha theory. Okay, so to develop the proof, I need two quantities, which are the normalized uh, energy. So you take this kind of Dirichlet energy, you normalize by R, the power R. So you integrate on a bool of radius R and the good the good scaling is one over R because, uh, because you, you have two terms. The other term is the length and the length scale, scales like R. So you take the energy scaled, rescaled by the same scaling as for the length. So this is the typical uh, 
normalize energy. Um, then the flatness. So the flatness is something, is something that, uh, that um, well, this is, uh, there are many definitions of flatness. The one we use here you, is the Osdorf, you take the Osdorf distance. So take a, take a ball, you have you centered at the point X, which is in K, you take uh, an hyperplane, and you take, let's say, the Osdorf distance, which is not exactly the Osdorf distance, if you see well, but take the distance between this plane and K in the ball, and then you take the plane which approximates better the, the set. So you take the infimum of this distance, you find a, a plane which, which has the infimum of Osdorf distance of, of your set K in a ball, and you renormalize by R in the ball. So this is dimensionless, and you have a quantity that I call the flatness. Um, okay, then I, I introduce another notation is the separation. So what is separation? So I say that uh, K separates. So a set K separates, you need as an assumption that beta, the flatness is less than, let's say one half. As soon as beta is less than one half, I can define what means separate. So when it's less than one half, you have a plane like that that approximates your set. And you, you can define two balls which are located here and here. And you say that it separates when uh, those balls lie in different connected components of B minus K. So this is an example where it does not separate. And this is a case where it separates. So it is very, uh, very intuitive. But it's a crucial, uh, it's a crucial uh, notion because we use it as an assumption. We, we cannot do the proof. Well, this is a statement. Uh, the statement. The epsilon regularity uh, theorem that we get is the following one. If the two quantities, beta, flatness, and normalized energy are less than some threshold, epsilon zero, as usual. But if you assume, moreover, that K separates, then you get that in a smaller ball in C1 alpha. But we need uh, we need separation here. So we were inspired a lot in the, for this proof. We were inspired by the proof that is contained in the book of Guy David, uh, the, the book uh, where also he he has this this kind of stuff. The, the difference is that in the scalar case you can control the separation by the Coerva formula by filling the hole, etc. In our case we don't have the Coerva formula, so we just assume it separates, and then we have. Um, C1 alpha. Of course, this occurs almost H1 almost everywhere. So in the neighborhood of almost every point on the set K, you can find uh, those assumptions if K is connected. If K is connected, you can find this and the separation is, is true almost everywhere for connected set. Of course, the, here is a, uh, is a place where we need connected. Okay, um, so the basic idea is, as usual, when you do regularity things, you start you start in a ball where some quantities are small. So uh, here, the quantities are flatness and energy, and also you assume it's separate. And then you want to prove that in a smaller ball, the quantities have improved. This is the, the usual uh, the usual strategy. Um, so there are two main parts. As for Mumford chart, actually, if you if you compare with the original proof of Mumford chart, there were two main uh, there are two main things, two two main uh, let's say proposition that we, we bootstrap. So the first one is the energy decay. So for energy decay lemma says that if k is connected and flat, then the elastic energy decays uh, geometrically in half the ball. Okay, so this is a perturbative, to, to, to take the same word as Guido yesterday, it's a perturbative argument, perturbative argument. So you know that it's true. Okay, I will, I will discuss the proof just, just after, but um, okay. The rough out idea is that you know that it's true when K is a plane and, uh, and then you perturb it to say, to see that it's still true when you are flat. Uh, just a comment on this. This statement here, we don't need K to be a minimizer or whatever. It's just a set which is connected closed. So you're in the situation where K is a closed connected set 
and u is a function that satisfies the Lamé system, so which is the div e of u equals zero here. And then you have a decay of, of energy, of normalized energy. Um, the second part is the flatness decay. So the flatness decay says that if the quantities, the standard quantity are small, and if k separate, then you can bound the flatness in a smaller ball by the normalized energy with a power here, one over 14, which is not very important. But the main point is that you can bound the flatness by the energy. Now, if the flatness is small, then the energy decays. So at the end, you can bootstrap those two statements and obtain that the beta decays like a power of the radius. OK? So again, under those assumptions that the flatness and beta is small, smaller than 1 over, uh, one over 1,000, then first of all, the energy decays geometrically. Secondly, beta is smaller than the energy. So at the end, beta decays. And if beta decays like a power of the radius, then you are C1 alpha. Okay. Uh, this is what I explained here. So proposition one plus proposition two implies the decaying of uh, the flatness and you will to C1 alpha. Um, okay. Okay, now proof of proposition one, I will not give uh, much details. I will concentrate more. I don't have a lot of time, so uh, I will concentrate on the proof of proposition two. Uh, proof of proposition one, as I said, is by compactness or perturbative argument. You know that the, so you have, if, if K is a, is, a, is a hyperplane, and if here you have an equation like div E of U equals zero, and here, E of u tensor the normal equals zero. So you have a Neumann problem here. Um, then you can prove that the, by regularity, elliptic regularity theory, you know that the energy will decay much faster than R. We have uh, R squared, let's say. So now you want to, so this is it's similar to the compactness argument that is used already in all the Fusco-Palaras proof, but uh, different. So now, if, if you have a set which is epsilon close to a plane, epsilon close in other distance, you want to say that you can pass to the limit in this problem and to get the contradiction. So if for any epsilon you don't decay, you can construct a sequence that uh, will contradict um, the, the decaying at the limit. And the decaying at the limit is true because you have an interplane, and then you get the contradiction. What is really difficult here is to pass to the limit because you have a sequence of key n, which are sets, and you have sequence of solution of a Neumann problem, and you want to pass to the limit uh, in, when key n converge to k in the Hausdorff sense. This is false in general. If k has no regularity at all, if it's just closed set, uh, you will not pass to the limit. It is false. Uh, you want to pass to the limit strongly in, uh, so that the gradient, the, the symmetrical gradient goes strongly in L2 to the symmetrical gradient. So for closed sets, which are general, you cannot pass to the limit in the normal problem. This is uh, classical. Um, so here with the connected assumption, we can, uh, so here connected helps to pass to the limit, but still it is not trivial because uh, we have the, the, the Lamé system here and it is not trivial to pass to the limit in the Lamé system for the normal problem. And the trick is to use the Airy function. So take the harmonic conjugate, let's say. So for in the scalar case, it will be the harmonic conjugate, which will be a Dirichlet, Dirichlet problem. It is, not, it is known for Dirichlet problem that you have spherac and then you have convergence. And so we use this kind of uh, construction, which, he, which relies on the Airy function constructed by duality. And this was used uh, in an earlier paper in a different framework, but we use, let's say, similar tools. To, to, to pass the limit and to get the energy decay here. So again, it uses the connected assumption on K here to pass the limit, but I am not, uh, I am not sure that it is uh, necessary because if you have a sequence of minimizer, here we don't use that Kn are minimizer of the Griffith energy. We use just they are connected. 
So if you probably using that there are minimizers, you can pass the limit uh, in a different way. So I'm not sure here connected is really needed, but it was convenient to do it like that because for proposition two, we really use the separation. Okay. Uh, now proof of proposition uh, two. Some ideas. So the main uh, the main standard uh, tool is the is the height estimate. So how to control beta? So remember proposition two. For first, I should give you the statement. Proposition two says that when the energy and the flatness is small, then beta is controlled by the energy. So you want to control beta. You want to control beta. So the way you control beta is the following. So if you have a curve, any curve, uh, this is the standard inequality. If you have a curve, you can control the distance of the curve to a segment by what is called the excess of density. So this is excess of density. So you see is the, the difference between the, the length of the curve minus the length of the segment that, uh, that connects the two endpoints of the curve. And the excess of density, which is this quantity, controls the square of this distance. Uh, with this, this is this is a product here. You have the length, but the length here is not a problem because you have you have a alpha regular. So the, the length in the ball is controlled by the radius of the ball. So this locally, this will be, give you that the ball, uh, the, the radius of the ball uh, times the excess of density in the ball controls beta um, uh, beta square. Why I say square root of beta? No, it controls beta square. Controls beta square. Okay, so this is just Pythagoras inequality. Uh, that's all. In dimension two, is very difficult. It's very simple. In dimension two, you have this Pythagoras. Which, well, it works also in, uh, in any dimension for pure. Right? Okay, now what is the usual strategy if you want to prove uh, to use this this curve? So you have your uh, you have your set K, which is very flat. So you are in the standard assumption and the. the Take a ball, a first ball, where you know that you are almost flat, so you know that beta is less than epsilon zero, which means that you are very close to a plane in the ball, like that. Okay, in this situation, what you want to do, which is very typical in many, many problems, if, if you want to do the regularity theory in dimension two or in dimension one for the set, what you do is that you want to, com you want to compare the, the, the set in a ball with uh, with a segment. Uh, if you are so, if you are able to, to to compare the set with a segment, you will automatically uh, have an estimate on the excess of density because, uh, of course, you will have. But uh, the non-trivial thing is to be able also to define a function u. So you want for the set for the set k, you want to replace k by a segment in the ball. But then you have to define a function u. Which is admissible with this new set, which is k replaced by a segment. So morally, it looks easy, but uh, in practical, if you try to do it, it's not so easy. So you need to construct a new function, let's say v, that has an energy comparable to u, because then if it's an admissible couple, you will get something like in the ball vr. This uh, k differs. Um, from the new competitor only in a bull VR. So you will get something like this. And if you are able to construct a new function V, you have it here. And here you have the length of the segment here S, let's say, this is segment S. This is what you want to do because then uh, if E of V is less than C times the energy of, of U, here you have H1 of K minus H1 of S, which is the excess of density, which will be less than the energy of your function in the ball. And this controls exactly your beta square times R. And so uh, you are happy because with this competitor, you can control beta by the energy. 
So this inequality is the geometrical height estimate that I give you just before. Uh, this is your competitor, and, and you get this. So morally, it is easy to, to produce. Uh, the, the strategy is clear, is to replace K by a segment. But to do that is not so easy because you have to control the, the, the new function V, construct a new function V, and to control its elastic energy, so the symmetrical gradient, from the one of you, from some trace or something. So this is not so easy. Let's see what we can do. So basically, we do two competitors. Uh, the first one is what I call the wall, the wall competitor that we also do in other, uh, for instance, Guy did it in his book. So it's to replace the set K in the ball by, by a segment, but adding some, some walls, uh, which gives you a first density estimate that you then improve in a second competitor. Okay, even this one is not trivial for the Griffiths energy. Um, I will explain why. So what we do, uh, as usual, now we have the Griffiths minimizer, you have a set K which, is, which separates in the ball and for which beta plus energy is smaller than epsilon. Okay, the first thing we can do is to consider this region here and here, which does not touch K. Here, there is no singular set in those two regions, so you have corn inequality. Um, since you have corn inequality, you control the full gradient here by the elastic gradient, uh, the symmetrical gradient here. Then we can select a circle here. So there is a selection of good circle. So the selection of good circle is a, is a radius t such that in average, the the tangential gradient of u on this circle is controlled by the average of the full gradient in the, in the full, uh, you do a Chebyshev and you select a circle so that you control the, the tangential gradient of u. The real term, this is difficult in general because the tangential gradient here on the circle is not, is, you cannot rely this, uh, relate, uh, you cannot uh, relate this with the, uh, with the symmetrical gradient in general. But since we have corn here in this region, at least on this part of the circle, the green part here, at least on this part, I can control this quantity on this green part, not, not here in, in this part, by the elastic energy. Okay, then we can do an extension from that circle and construct a new competitor V, the function V, associated to a competitor for K. So K is a set and I replace K by not only the segment, but the segment, but I also add some two little pieces of wall, some, some small wall here so that the function is well-defined because you want that it coincides. So my new function V here is a function V which is, lives here outside K and that coincides with U in uh, omega minus the ball. So I have a competitor for you for this new set where I add some little words here. Okay, this gives a new function V and uh, this new function V, but you do what, whatever extension you want from this trace, you will have some, we, we did with the Poisson extension actually, the harmonic extension. And then we get a function that you, for which you control the full, um, the full gradient, but in particular the, the, the symmetrical gradient by the one of you. In this book. Okay, this gives you a an, an first, first good, good density estimate. It gives you the, the estimate that, so if, if, I, if I do this competitor, I will have that the elastic energy plus the, the length of K in the ball is less than this. But so this is the length of the segment. So I, I am happy because I, I will have the, the subtraction of this and this will give you the excess of density I am looking for. But I have some extra length here, H1 of the length of the wall. Okay, this is not, okay, so the first step. So the first step says you that the excess of density is less than, uh, than epsilon zero. Okay, but this, this competitor is used then to say that there are a lot of circles that intersect K by only two points. Okay, this is also, again, this part is, uh, let's say, standard. You do a first density estimate and you use it to control the number of points on the circle and then you can find a new ball that intersects with only two points. Because here, what was difficult is that the, intersec the intersection of K with the circle here is, uh, it could be very ugly. 
But if it intersects with only two points, then you are it's tempting to take the segment that, that link those two points. And then you don't have to add a wall. Because if you don't have, if you don't need to add a wall here, if it intersects with two points and you don't need to, to, uh, to add a wall here, uh, you don't have this term because this term is the length is the length of the wall. But uh, so this is why you are very interested by circles that intersect with only two points. And to have this, you need this first. Uh, okay. Uh, well, uh, very good. So this is our first uh, our first computer. Uh, just a remark here. This is admissible in the connected uh, class. So this is why I say if you if you minimize with connected constraint, uh, this is an admissible competitor. So it, so the proof goes through, and and then you have regularity also with connected constraint, which does not follow from the statement without connected constraint. Right. Just a remark. Okay, so then we do a more elaborated version of this um, to, to get better. Because here we have, I, I didn't finish here, you have the excess of density, which is less than the energy, plus beta. So you have beta square, which is less than beta. This looks uh, completely useless. Uh, so you, you need to improve this competitor. This competitor is not enough. Okay, so now I arrive to the most technical lemma. Uh, I, I, what time do I, I don't remember which uh, what time I have to finish at twenty right now? Okay. I think you have uh, five minutes. Uh, five minutes. Okay, so I arrive to the point. I, I arrive to the to the point uh, that we do a, a more sophisticated competitor, and I have this statement. So the statement says that. In the, in the basic situation here, for any eta which is arbitrarily small, so in the situation where k is flat and the energy is small and it separates, for any eta arbitrarily small, we can find two squares of size eta such that the set k is completely strapped into those two squares, which means that if I draw the strip here, there is no k here. And what is important here is that eta can be taken arbitrarily small. So eta is eta r. So you have the following picture for any, so for any eta, you can find two boxes because you are a minimizer, because k is a minimizer, because k separates in the ball, because it is flat and the energy is small. You can find two squares like that, which completely uh, trapped k. So that there is no k here. I will not explain the proof of this lemma. Don't have time, but still we can use corn inequality here in this domain because there is no k. But we lose a constant of order one over eta over four, or power four, uh, because here it is very thin. It is of it is of thickness eta, so you have to pay a price, which is one over eta. Then we have a selection of good square in this region, in which you control the full gradient, and then you can. Uh, uh, find a, a square for which the derivative is very under control everywhere on this, on this square. We can do an extension. So now we have a function V and we are happy. We have a good function V. We then select a new circle which intersect with only two points here. And we replace K by a segment in this selected circle. And we have this competitor, which is made by replacing K by a segment here. The addition of these two squares of size eta and for the function v, we have a, an extension procedure by selecting a good square in this part where we have corn inequality and we can define a new function v and we put this in the machine. When we put this in the machine, we get this estimate. So the, the excess of density here will be in the ball r over four. r over two is the, the, this size, the, the ball which is here, will be controlled by c eta r. c eta r is the length of those little squares that I have to add, plus the energy coming from the competitor v. And the price is that we have c over eta power six. This is not a problem because we take then eta of the of the order omega one over seven, and we arrive to some excess of density which is controlled by purely the energy with power one, one, one over seven. This controls beta over um, square, and so at the end we have uh, we have beta which is controlled by omega with a 
uh, another power which is one over 14 and this is this ends the proof of the of the second proposition so the, the competitor is the this one which was a bit uh, a bit more sophisticated than usual because of this elastic and Griffiths energy. Okay, in the last part, I wanted just to, to mention how we can straighten the, the other dimension of the singular set. And for that, we use uniform rectifiability. So it's a, it's a standard statement that if you have a connected set, which is alpha regular and of finite length, then it is uniformly rectifiable. Uh, then I, I wanted to tell you what is re uniform rectifiability, but I uh, don't have much time. It was a very long story written by David and Sams related to the risk transform, etc. But the, the main point is that when you are uniformly rectifiable, then beta is controlled in a uniform uh, way. So in other words, the place where beta is small is uh, uh, the place where beta is large is a porous, porous uh, set, por porous set. And this comes automatically from the uniform rectifiability, which comes automatically from the fact that you are connected finite length and, uh, and one alpha regular. And this tells you that the epsilon regularity theorem, you can, you can uh, initiate it at many places, not only almost everywhere, but uniformly in a, in a, in a place of other dimension less than one. Uh, the main point is that we don't need not only that beta and omega are small, we need also that it separates. So we had to prove that, uh, that if you have a connected set, which is one alpha regular uh, finite length uh, and connected, then the place where uh, beta and omega are large or k, k does not separate is a porous, uh, is a porous set. And then we have the other dimension uh, by standard testing. Um, okay, and for the high integrality of the gradient, is the strategy is similar to the field piece and Figali. Uh, they, we, we follow the same approach, but we need to um, we, we need to have a similar uh, uh, good uh, good estimates on the solution of the Lamé system with planes and, and try to improve by porous uh, porous arguments. Also. Okay. I will finish uh, my talk uh, on, on that. Well, it's the last slide. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Antoine. Are there any questions? Any question from remote? Berardo? Hi, Antoine. Ciao. Um, ciao. It's Berardo uh, because I see very, very, very small. <laughs> I think it's Berardo. It's, it's me, yes. <laughs> um, but, well, a curiosity if it's doable in uh, a few, few minutes. Uh, how do you select the small cubes? I didn't understand if you expand it. Uh, it's a kind of... Uh, yes, I, I, it's, a, it's a pity because it's one of the key points, but so... You take your, your set, you know that it's flat, and you know that uh, you know that it's alpha regular, you know that it separates, which is also very important. And then what do you do? You take some a lot of strips here and here of size, you do a lattice of size eta r. And then you take here the lattice here for which the length has less than the average. Um, you take a, let's say a strip which contains the less length as possible. And once you control the length, it is enough by alpha regularity and by uh, to control actually the distance because so it is not so so simple because you are connected, but uh, as you know, if you intersect a connected set by with something, uh, it's not connected. So if you have a connected set and you control the length, then you control its, its distance, its diameter. So it's a bit the same strategy here. So you you take you take a, you select you select the strip here which control the, the which has the less length as possible, and then we are able to prove that there are no little pieces like that, very far away from the box. So main let's say so you arrive to you know that in other words by by average argument you know that here you have some length. In the strip SK of order eta r. 
which means that since here you have a curve that connect two points, it cannot go very far from the box here. But it could be that there are a lot, some little pieces here that could be very, <laughs> very far away. Uh, but this actually not, do not happen because, well, it cannot, okay, it cannot be in the interior because you are uniformly, you are alpha regular. So here, by alpha regularity, the little piece here will have too much density in the ball of size eta. And since all the length has be uh, all the length has be spent for this curve, you cannot have a another big length, another big piece here. So there are no there are no other little pieces far away. This by just alpha regularity, I don't need connected here. But I need separation by uh, to to have this first curve that spend all the eta r. Okay, I, I don't know if I'm clear here, but. It's, it's elementary. You select a good strip to have eta r. Once you have eta r, you have necessarily a curve because it separates. If you don't have a curve, it, it will not separate. So you have at least a curve. Once you have a curve, it spends eta r length. Once you have eta r length on this curve, it cannot, you cannot have a little piece here, another one, because otherwise, by alpha regularity, it will have of order eta r also. And so there are uh, there is a unique box that contains everything, something like that. Oh, okay, thank you, Anton. Okay. Other questions? If not, thank uh, our speaker again. Thank you. So lunch time we resume at uh, two p.m. Correct. So let's have uh, everybody back. So we start this afternoon session with a talk of Marcello Puntiglione from Roma, that is going to speak about stability result for non-local geometric evolution. Please. Thank you very much. And I would like to also to thank the organizers for inviting me. And I'm very happy today to, to be here and to give this talk. And in this talk, I will discuss some uh, recent results with uh, many co-authors. So with Cesaroni, Chambol, Chris Male, De Luca, Kubin, Morini, Nino, and Novaga about stability results of uh, non-local geometric uh, evolutions. So by stability, um, we mean stability of uh, the geometric evolutions, uh, which is the evolution of a set, of a set where the normal velocity of the boundary uh, is proportional to uh, the curvature of the set of, of that point, where the curvature could be either a local object, like the um, standard mean curvature, or a non-local object uh, I will introduce very soon. No? And then we are interested in stability with respect to uh, variations of these curvatures, local, either local or non-local. So the problem will be we have a sequence of curvatures so converging to a limit curvature. So we have a sequence of geometric evolutions. We want to understand if uh, whether these uh, solutions converge to the limit evolution governed by the limit curvature. In particular, we will be interested in a sequence of curvatures uh, parameterized by uh, some parameter S, for instance, mainly fractional curvatures, where S is defined in uh, the interval 0, 1. And we will be interested in the limit behavior, so S converging to 1 and S converging to 0. Then we will extend the, this notion of fractional uh, perimeters and curvatures also for uh, negative uh, values of the parameter S. And still we will be interested in the limit uh, as S tends to zero, this time from the left. So somehow we want to extend the notion of fractional and curvature flows for negative S and to show, to show that uh, for S tending to zero, either from the right or from the left, they glue together at uh, the value S equal to zero. Then uh, still we want to consider the last possible case, S larger than one. As we will see, somehow the perimeters and the curvatures blow up as S tends to one. So for S larger than one, both the perimeters and the curvatures will be infinite. We will introduce suitable normalization procedures based on co-reduce approaches. And we want to show the limit, we want to study the limit as the regularization parameter R tends to zero. Finally, if I will have time, I will discuss also the um, linear case corresponding to 
uh, it uh, uh, fraction it flows instead of the geometric flows. Okay, first, uh, let me introduce uh, the class uh, of non-local curvatures. So we will use the formalism, we will adopt the formalism introduced together with Chamboli and Morini. And what is a um, non-local curvature? So it will be a function dep depending on a point X and the set E. So in the case of local curvature, we'll, we'll have that the curvature depend on local quantities, like the, for instance, the, the principal curvature at E, while here we'll consider curvatures depending on the wall shape of the set E itself. And we want that this curvature will satisfy suitable uh, uh, properties. Sorry. So the first one, which is uh, maybe the most important, uh, is the monotonicity. So monotonicity says that if we have two sets, one inside the other, then the curvature of the smallest set is higher than the curvature of the larger set. So this is very important in order to guarantee um, the, the um, a comparison principle during the flow. So in order to have uh, uniqueness of the flow. Then uh, the second property is uh, translation invariance, which is a kind of technical assumption, saying that if you have uh, everything is invariant with respect uh, to translations. Then we have continuity, and continuity says that if we have a sequence of sets converging smoothly, then the corresponding curvature also converge smoothly. Finally, the last assumption is uh, really a technical assumption, not very relevant. Just for simplicity, we assume that the curvature of a set is equal to minus the curvature of the complement. And this is, for instance, of course, the case of the standard mean curvature. Okay, then um, we are dealing with the, um, our geometric evolution. Every set will move according with the low normal velocity equal to minus curvature. But in fact, uh, we are interested in uh, solutions which are defined for all times. So also after the possible formation of singularities. So in order to treat the case of, um, of uh, irregular solutions, we want to introduce notions, weak notions for solutions. And in fact, we will deal with the, um, level set formulations and uh, the notion of viscosity solutions for the level set formulation. So let me introduce it very briefly. In the uh, level set formulation, we consider auxiliary functions u and we let uh, evolve uh, in uh, the geometric, uh, uh, according to the geometric law, all the super levels of the set u. So instead of having an evo a geometric evolution of a single set, we have, in fact, a geometric evolution involving all the super level of this auxiliary function u, which is called the level set function. Then the geometric evolution becomes, in fact, a parabolic equation with respect to this auxiliary function, which is this one, the time derivative of u plus the modulus of the gradient of u times the curvature of the super level is equal to zero. Then you see that the curvature here is defined on super levels of the test functions. As you imagine that U is a continuous function. So in general, this set will be not really regular. And the point is that in our formulation, it is enough to, to define the curvature K, the general no local curvature K, only on a smooth set. Now, so now the point is that this object in general is not well defined, but as usual, the point is to enforce the equation, in fact, on smooth functions, like in, I don't know, distributional theories. And in the viscosity set, in fact, uh, you enforce the equation on suitable barriers, so on suitable test function touching the function u either from above or from below. And instead of imposing the equality, you impose the corresponding inequalities. And this is the, the viscosity formalism of the level set formulation. So you impose the equation on smooth function, define sub-solution, super-solutions for function, test function phi, which are smooth and which are touching you from above or from below. 
you have the corresponding inequalities. And now you see that the equation or the inequality almost makes sense in the sense that here you have super levels of smooth functions. Now, super level of smooth, smooth functions generically are smooth, except on level which are critical. So the good point of this theory is that um, in order to have, for instance, uniqueness of the evolution, it is enough to, to enforce the equation only on non-critical levels where this set is regular and the curvature is really well defined. The only care is that in fact, uh, you have to enforce something also at points which are not only critical, but really where uh, the contact point is flat, where the gradient of the contact is equal to zero. So in this case, uh, the right equation to, to be enforced is that uh, looking at this equation, Formally here you have zero times something. The right thing to do, to do is to consider this zero times something equal to zero. And so the equation becomes times derivative equal to zero or the corresponding inequalities in the notion of sub and several solution. Okay, now there is a small technicality that in fact, uh, this, is, uh, this information is really needed in order to have uniqueness of the flow. Because for instance, assume that your function is already constant. What you want to say that is that this con for this constant, so every contact point with a constant, of course, will be flat. You want that the equation for constant function is that the constant doesn't move, does not depend on time. Otherwise, you could have, uh, looking at the super level of a constant that, uh, in fact, is not constant in time, you would have uh, instantaneous, uh, instantaneous appearance of huge set, or on the contrary, you would have that the wall space disappear instantaneously if just this constant moves up and down. So the super levels of constant functions are really not very stable. And this you don't want. You don't want that in the geometric evolution, a set, a huge set appears instantaneously or disappears instantaneously. So this is why we need to, to enforce something at flat regions. Well, now there is another technical point. Maybe I don't have really time to talk about this, but I want to spend a few words about this. A technical point is then, uh, okay, we have to interpret this product as zero, but it is not clear that it is really, we are really allowed to do that because here we have zero times something. And this something could be easily understood as plus or minus infinity. So assume you have a parabola. You are at the minimum point of a parabola. Then you have that, uh, okay, assume that the parabola is minus x squared. Then you have a point, go a little bit down. The super level is a, a small circle. So here you have that the gradient of the parabola is uh, very small. The curvature is huge. So essentially, if you perturb a little bit the situation where the contact point is flat, you end up in a super level where you have that the gradient is very small and the curvature is huge. And now the question is that if uh, this product somehow stabilizes to zero, vanishes or not. And yet it is quite surprising that it depends on the homogeneity properties of the curvature. For the mean curvature, it, it converges to zero. Otherwise it depends on how flat is uh, this test function. So depending on the homogeneity of K, one has to restrict uh, the class of the admissible functions and should consider functions which are flat enough around flat points. This is a notion introduced by Ischens when it is exactly to treat cases which are a little bit more general than the mean curvature, but still local. The same trick um, somehow works also for these more local evolutions. Well, now I gave a general definition of no local curvatures. Um, now I want to, to, to enforce some extra assumption in order to have existence of the uniqueness of the geometric flow. So the first assumption is the following. We assume that curvature of bolts of radius rho could be negative, but not too negative. So they should be larger than a constant minus the constant times rho. This essentially says that during the evolutions 
the, the ball can grow up, but at most exponentially fast. So they can grow up, of course, in the case of the mean curvature, we expect that the ball shrinks. Here they can grow up at most exponentially. At most exponentially means that they cannot blow up infinite time. And so this assumption is somehow the minimal assumption that guarantees existence of bounded solutions for all times. Second assumption is needed in order to have uh, the uniqueness of the flow. So remember in the definition of uh, curvature, I asked continuity with respect to smooth variations of sets. In order to have uniqueness, we have to enforce a little bit uh, this assumption. And we have to ask somehow that this continuity is uniform in the class of all sets enjoying a uniform ball condition. So this means that uh, if you have a set and we perturb this set uh, with a smooth diffeomorphism, then the curvature changes, but it is con the difference is controlled with uh, the C2 distance of the diffeomorphism from the identity through a modulus of continuity, small omega, which is uniform in the class of all sets, uh, somehow which have uh, bounded curvatures. Bounded curvatures in a, this no local framework means just enjoying an external and internal Bohr condition of radius capital R. So fixed this class, the curvature is uniformly continuous with respect to, to perturb the set with small diffeomorphism. Now, under these two assumptions, we have uh, under the first one, we have existence of a global solution. And uh, under the second assumption, we have that the solution is unique. Solution in the level set formulation in the sense of viscosity solutions. So we have an initial datum mu zero, which is compact out of a, a compact set, which is a zero out of a compact set. And this means that the super levels are either bounded or the complement is bounded. So we are dealing with the evolution of surfaces which are compact. And for any given initial set U0, we consider the level set equation, meaning that we consider all the super levels of U0 evolve. All these super levels solve the parabolic equation we have seen before. This equation in the viscosity sense is, is the unique solution of the level set equation in the viscosity sense. Moreover, we have some, uh, um, some kind of a priori regularity on the solution. The solution is uniformly continuous in, uh, in space and time. So should I read the, the chat, see if there are questions? So we have existence and uniqueness under this few extra assumption. Uniform continuity and uh, lower bound on the curvature of the, the balls. Well, now we, I want to consider this was for a fixed curvature. Now I want to go back to the original problem where we have a sequence of curvatures and we want to, to study stability of geometric flows with respect to this sequence of curvatures. So let Kn be a sequence of non-local curvatures, all satisfying this strong continuity assumption uniform in order to have uniqueness of the flow. Again, I want the, that balls blow up at most exponentially fast. But now in order to get a limit uh, evolution, which still is defined for all time, I want that uh, balls can uh, blow up uh, at most exponentially, but exponentially with a uniform prefactor. So I want that the curvature of the balls is bounded by minus constant times rho, where this constant is uniformly bounded. Then uh, I assume that the curvatures converges to some limit curvature. And what do I mean by convergence of the curvatures? This is really uniform convergence. So the assumption is that for every sequence of sets EN, which converges smoothly to some limit set E, then the corresponding curvatures KN computed on a point of the boundary VN converge to the limit curvature K infinity computed at the same point on the boundary of the limit set E. Again, I want that also the limit geometric evolution is unique. So I assume that also K infinity satisfy this uniform uh, continuity property. And then we have stability of the corresponding uh, geometric evolutions. 
So we consider solution, geometric evolutions governed by the curvature Kn. They converge locally uniformly to the unique geometric evolution governed by the limit curvature K infinity. Okay, this is the abstract result. And uh, now I want to apply this abstract result to some specific cases, starting from the fractional uh, mean curvature flows. So I recall what is a fractional perimeter and what fractional curvature is. So I will focus on sets uh, which are bounded or at least with finite measure. And then the, for every S in zero one, the S fractional perimeter is defined as the interaction of the set E with the complement of E through this potential, which is one over the distance between X and Y to the power D plus S. Okay, so you can imagine this uh, energy as something which is repulsive from the set E and its complement. Or in a dual way, in a dual ways like some interaction of the set E with itself, which is attractive. So in this sense, you can imagine that this is a kind of perimeter because for instance, if the set E attracts itself, the minimal shape for fixed volume is a ball, exactly like for the standard perimeter. Just a remark, I can write here the, the power as D plus two S over two. So we see that this uh, fractional perimeter is nothing but a Gallardo seminorm of the characteristic function of, uh, of E to the power two. Okay. So the first limit I want to consider is the limit as S tend to one. So for S tending to one, these perimeters blow up tend to plus infinity. But it is, it is well understood that uh, if you scale them, so they blow up uh, as one over one minus S. If you scale them multiplying by one minus S, then they converge to the standard Euclidean perimeter. In fact, it is known that these norms suitably scaled converge to the total variation. This is a result by Burgen, Brezis, Mirunescu. And uh, in fact, uh, they converge uh, then in, in, uh, in another paper by David that has been proved, it has been found the, the, the correct prefactor in front of the BV variation. This uh, convergence is pointwise on smooth sets. In fact, you, if you want convergence uh, also on those smooth sets, you have to modify it a little bit the kernel. And then this convergence uh, holds true also in the sense of gamma convergence as proved by Ambrosio, De Filippi, De Filippi and Martinazzi. Okay, a, let, a little bit less understood is the other case where S tends to zero. In this case, still everything blows up to, to infinity. And uh, in fact, if you multiply by S, the perimeter, then it converges to a constant times the Lebesgue measure. So the limit is very degenerate because it's just Lebesgue measure. This has been proved by many authors, uh, Mazia Shaposnikova, and uh, in the case of the relative perimeter by Di Piero Fig uh, Figali Palatucci and Baldinoci. And now the question is the following. Here the limit is kind of degenerate. We could still, uh, now what we want to do, we want to consider the corresponding geometric evolution. So if the energy, the Lebesgue measure, the first variation, that is the corresponding curvature, will be just a constant. So in the limit, we will have sets that move with constant velocity. We have this theorem, but somehow it's not really satisfactory. We would like to see the next term in the expansion as S tends to zero, both in the perimeter and in the curvature. This means that instead of uh, scaling the perimeter, we want to take the perimeter and renormalize it, removing the infinite amount, which is blowing up, and to see what is the remaining uh, bounded quantity which can be seen as a kind of a normalized uh, perimeter. Okay, this is what we do. So next order analysis as S tends to zero. And the, the, the main observation is the following. If we take positive S, we take the perimeter and we renormalize it. We can write this uh, quantity as a sum of two terms. The first one, which is, uh, depends on the small parameter one or in general rho, is uh, the interaction of the set E with the complement 
through the same uh, potential, but just uh, for uh, pairs of points which are at a distance smaller than rho. The second term instead uh, is minus uh, the interaction of the set e with itself, uh, but uh, at scale larger than rho. So interaction for points which are not too near to each other. Now, this is positive. This is negative, but the point is that it is clear that the negative part is bounded if uh, the measure of E is finite. Because you see, this is smaller than one, the integral. So we have that the second addend is smaller than a constant. So we have something positive plus something bounded. And so the sum always makes sense, also for S equal to zero. So this uh, representation can be used to define the limit energy when uh, S is equal to zero. So this is the definition, the zero fractional perimeter can be defined as the sum of these two energy functionals or equivalently, equivalently which is uh, convenient for some computations. You can also play a little bit with this parameter rho, but if you change rho, then somehow this introduces an extra constant in the renormalization procedure, which is d omega d log rho times the volume of E. Well, this is not only formal because this is also the, the real, the true gamma limit of these perimeters as S tends to zero. So again, when S tends to zero, the perimeter blows up, blows up as a, like a constant, which is converging to plus infinity times the Lebesgue measure. If we subtract this, uh, this leading term, a finite quantity remains, which is this zero fractional perimeter, which is in fact the gamma limit after this uh, renormalization procedure. Well, this is uh, what we have concerning the energies. But in fact, we were interested in the geometric evolution, so in the limit of curvatures. Now, the curvatures are the first variations of the perimeters with respect to, to um, perturbing the sets through diffeomorphies. And now the point is that one, uh, once you understand which is the limit of the energies, the limit of the first variations doesn't provide any surprise. So everything goes smoothly. The first variations converge to the corresponding first variations. So for S tending to one, we have that the first variation of the fractional perimeter, which is the fractional mean curvature, which is defined through an explicit formula, converges, converges once scaled to the first variation of the perimeter, which is the mean curvature. K1. Not only converges, but the convergence is smooth, is smooth enough in order to apply our stability results. And this means that we have convergence of the flows. So as S converges to one from the left, the fractional mean curvature flows. Now you have to scale the curvatures in order to have convergence of the curvature. You can do two things which are absolutely equivalent. Either you scale the curvature in the equation or you reparameterize the time. So here I, I have chosen to reparameterize the time. So after reparameterization in times, the solutions converge uniformly to the unique solution of the standard mean curvature flow. And this is for S tending to one. This result was already known and it was essentially proved by Imbert, uh, who studied the convergence of the, of the curvature of the fractional curvatures to the, to the standard mean curvature. Now, the case S which tends to zero is uh, maybe a little bit new. And uh, again, remember that the perimeter, the idea was to write the perimeter of, as the sum of these two contributions. And uh, moreover, if you choose uh, the parameter R in front of this two fun, two function are large enough, you immediately realize that the second hand then disappear because this was the interaction for points uh, uh, inside E at a distance larger than R. If R is larger than the diameter of E, then this, this second hand then disappears. And so you have that essentially this is the zero fractional perimeter. And for this, it's very easy to compute the first variation, and it looks very similar to the classical uh, fractional uh, mean curvatures with S just replaced by zero. 
So it's easy to compute. Again, the fractional curvatures, once renormalized, converge smoothly to this zero fractional mean curvature. And in particular, uh, so this is a kind of first order analysis. If instead of removing the leading term, you scale by the leading term, this is easier. You have that the curvature multiplied by S converge to, to just a constant, a constant which is uh, the first variation of the Lebesgue measure. So again, the first variation of the limit energy. So we have two kinds of uh, asymptotic results, zero order and first order. And uh, we have uh, two corresponding uh, stability results for the geometric evolutions. The first one is the following at zero order. Consider the S fractional mean curvature flows. Then uh, after scaling, uh, reparameterizing the time, these evolutions converge to this trivial evolution where the super levels of U move just with the constant uh, velocity, the constant being D times omega D. Next order, instead of scaling the curvature, so instead of reparameterizing the time, we can remove the leading term. And this means just considering the fractional mean curvature flow with a forcing term, a forcing term which is a constant and which is given by the leading term in the expansion of the curvature. So this is the forced mean curvature flow. As uh, S tends to zero, this convergence this uh, evolution converges to the geometric evolution governed by the limit uh, curvature, which is the zero fractional curvature. Well, so this is, uh, concludes the analysis as S tends to zero from the, from the right. Now I want to introduce something new. I want to introduce the notion of uh, fractional perimeters for negative uh, S. So this is, uh, Quite easy, you take the same uh, interaction. Now S is negative. But uh, instead uh, of, uh, so this is uh, now the power uh, is the integrable. So instead of letting the set E interact with the complement, you can let the set E interact with itself. So you integrate over E and again over E. So changing, replacing the complement with the set E itself, uh, it's like to changing sign to the interaction. And so it's somehow like replacing a perimeter with a, an anti-perimeter. So the minimizers wouldn't like to be any more a ball, would be the dust, this is not good. So we have again to multiply by minus one in order to have a real perimeter. So it's like fractional perimeters, but the, with the interaction of E with itself and with the minus in front of the double integral. And in fact, you, you can easily realize that this object is uh, maybe even easier than fractional perimeters because uh, somehow corresponds to the integrable case where the kernel now is integrable. You can, of course, uh, uh, understand this uh, as a um, fractional perimeter with uh, negative uh, S. S smaller than minus D, otherwise this will become um, a negative power and then it doesn't make any more sense because Again, it will become a, an anti-perimeter. Well, again, I, I want to so now I can define the geometric evolution corresponding to this Ritz energy functional. And I'm interested in the limit as S tends to zero. And the result is that uh, the limit is the same as the limit of positive S tending to zero. So we have fractional perimeters converging after the normalization to the zero fractional perimeters. We have Ritz potentials uh, after the renormalization, they converge to the same zero fractional perimeter. And here I want to, to say something. Again, this is a perimeter and it is clear, uh, maybe now it's even more clear that uh, the, um, the isoperimetric problem for S equal to zero gives back the Euclidean ball, like for the Euclidean perimeter. This can be easily maybe understood considering the case of negative S. So for negative S, we have uh, sets E attracting themselves. So this uh, is, uh, uh, now if you fix the volume and the set attract itself, the minimum is given by a round ball. So 
So this is the reason why planets essentially are around if they attract themselves to gravitational force, assuming that they are somehow, they don't rotate, stuff like that. And so this is essentially, this is called the Ritz inequality. Essentially, it's the superimetric inequality for a, a non-local uh, perimeter, which is given by the interaction of a set with itself. So it's kind of clear that also in the limit case s equal to zero, the set still feels this attraction and the ball is still a minimizer. On the other hand, one could consider a superimetric inequality for positive s. Again, there are disposal superimetric inequality saying that the ball is the minimizer. Letting s to zero, it is not surprising that also the zero fractional perimeter satisfies the superimetric inequality with the ball. Now we can compute the first variation. I will be fast here because time is running. Uh, the result is that this renormalized curvatures converge again to the limit uh, zero fractional curvature, either at first order or at zero order, they converge to a constant. And again, we have convergence of the corresponding geometric flows. So I will skip uh, to read the, the statement because it's exactly the, as before, but now S is converging to zero from the left. Okay, finally, last case, I want to consider the, so what, just to complete the, analy the analysis of fractional perimeters for all possible values of S. So the natural range of S is between zero and one. Then uh, we have considered the case of negative S. And uh, the last case is S larger than or equal to one. Now remember that uh, for S going to one, the fractional perimeters somehow concentrate and gamma converge to the Euclidean perimeter. Now the point is that for S larger than one, you have to think that these perimeters are even more concentrated and essentially they are plus infinity, but this plus infinity could be understood as plus infinity times the Euclidean perimeter. So this is what we want to formalize by uh, regularization procedures and essentially removing the core of the energy. So removing the interactions at very small scales R. So we take the potential, we truncate it at scales smaller than small R. So we get a finite quantity, a finite perimeter and a finite uh, uh, corresponding first variation. That here is not written in the slide, sorry. As R tends to zero, this quantity blows up, but uh, we know the rate in which it blows up. Now S is fixed. The parameter is this R that measures how much we are regularizing the perimeter. For fixed S larger than one, as R tends to zero, the perimeter blows up with these rates. If we renormalize these perimeters, then the gamma limit will be again the Euclidean perimeter. This formalizes that for S larger than one, the energy is infinite, but after regularization is a huge number times the Euclidean perimeter in terms of gamma convergence. Well, then we have the corresponding stability of geometric evolutions. We can fix this regularization R considering the geometric evolutions. As R tends to zero, the corresponding solutions suitably reparametrized in time converge to the standard uh, to the standard um, mean curvature flow. Ah, maybe I want to come, sorry, I want to comment here first before the, sorry, before the dynamics, I want to comment on the statics of this problem. So this, somehow this fact is uh, also quite well understood, I have to say. For S equal to one, what we are doing is, our, uh, is to, to take something that formally you remember was like the one half Gallardo seminorm of characteristic function, which is very relevant in material science. And we are regularizing it. And we are trying to understand that the gamma limit after scaling is the perimeter. 
So we are doing it through a core, core radius, but in fact, there are other approaches which are maybe even more natural, um, like approximating the Gallardo seminorm through phase field approximations that were already known. So essentially for S equal to one and using phase field approximation, this kind of analysis has been done by Alberti Bellettini, Alberti Buscite Sepesce, Garoni Muller. Um, uh, for S equal to one. And uh, the convergence of the curvature for S, mainly for S larger than one, were also considered in the literature by Bernstein Pagliari, Mazzon Rossi Toledo. Somehow we do an approach that is uh, based on core radius approximation. And we consider both the convergence of the energies, convergence of the curvatures, and convergence of the corresponding geometric evolutions. Now, as I was saying, we have convergence of the corresponding geometric evolutions, and also this uh, kind of analysis is not really new. The case S equal to one was considered by Dalio for Cadel Monno. Um, the case S larger than one very recently by Cesaroni Pagliari. Let me also say something about this paper by Caffarelli and Suganidis, where they consider threshold dynamics for the fractional. Uh, so using the notion of fractional Laplacian, they consider the fractional heat flow, which involves the fractional Laplacian. And what they show is that for S between zero and one, this method gives back the fractional uh, geometric flow. For S between zero, for S between one and two, so larger than one, this method gives back the standard mean curvature flow. So it's a completely different techniques based on uh, fractional heat flow and threshold dynamics, but that push up the analysis until uh, S equal to two. Then for S larger than two doesn't really make sense because for S equal to two, the fractional Laplacian is the, the local Laplacian. Somehow with the core radius approximation, one can consider also the case S, uh, whatever S larger than one, so even larger than two. But the result is somehow consistent. With the, with the one back of Frelin Suganidis. While very recently, Cesaroni and Pagliari re really did something similar for S, for any S larger than, uh, than one. Well, now I wanted to, to, to talk very briefly about the uh, similar problem, somehow easier, because it's the linear version of these geometric evolutions, which are just fractional heat flows. And uh, again, with the same kind of questions, what happens in the limit as S tends to one, and maybe more interestingly in the limit as S tending to zero. Very, very quick, let me say which is the problem. We consider the same kind of energy, but now we, we consider a, a generic functions U, not any more characteristic function. So again, the energy is still the Gallardo seminorm squared, but where U is no more a characteristic function. We consider functions u defined on omega and then extend on the whole space. And this is denoted by u tilde. And we want to do the gradient flow of this energy. This is the heat flow, the parabolic flow instead of the geometric flow. Now we have similar gamma convergence results for these energies. So again, as s, I will consider for simplicity now just the case s converging to one. As S tends to one, the energy suitably scaled converge to the L2 norm squared. The, after renormalization, the energy converges to some limit functional. Before we had the zero fractional perimeter, here we have something like a zero Gallardo seminorm that uh, can be written with a explicit formula. And as before, it is well defined because it is the sum of something which is positive, maybe plus infinity, plus something which is bounded. And now we want to do the gradient flow of these energies, and we want to see what happens as S tends to zero. So first variation, the first variation of the perimeter is the curvature, the fractional curvature. Here, the first variation is clearly the fractional Laplacian defined for all positive S, defined also when S tends to zero, giving back some limit, limit operators that could be understood as a zero Laplacian 
in real uh, variables or in Fourier variables. Uh, in fact, it was been um, introduced as a logarithmic Laplacian. They are not really the same, but uh, up to two different constants in their normalizations, essentially they are the same operator. Now we have uh, the limit uh, operator. We can state uh, our result. So the result is the following, consider the fractional lit flow. Consider S a sequence SN, which is converging uh, to zero. Then if you scale the operator, or again, the same, I parameterize the time, the solutions converge to the gradient flow of the limit energy. The limit energy was the square of a delta norm. The first variation is uh, constant times U. So we have, uh, again, this very degenerate uh, parabolic uh, flow. Derivative of U is equal to, itself, uh, to U itself. So point by point, this is just an ODE, and the solution is uh, the exponential. More interesting, if uh, instead of scaling the operator, you consider the forced fractional heat flow, and you send S to zero, then you converge to the interesting object, so to the parabolic flow corresponding to the zero fractional Laplacian. Uh, well, this, uh, if we have uh, some extra assumption on the initial data, we can al also say that time by time the energy converges, uh, and the time by time as uh, S tends to zero, we have a sequence which is optimal in energy. These are at the present details. And uh, in the last two, three minutes, let me just say uh, something about the, this theorem. This is in fact a general fact. Once you realize that uh, the energy functionals you are dealing with are uniformly lambda convex. So if you have a sequence of convex functionals and they gamma converge, somehow it's easy to pass to the limit also the gradient flows. If the functionals are lambda convex, but uh, lambda is uniform with respect to the sequence of energies, again, the gradient flow commutes very easily with the, um, with the gamma convergence. And this is the, what is contained in these abstract results. And in fact, you, you can prove this theorem also providing approximations to minimizing movements. So you have a sequence of lambda convex functionals. For each uh, functional, you consider the gradient flow as limit of minimizing movements. And you see that you have uh, very robust uh, quantitative estimates in order to, um, to that somehow are uniform both in the time step of the uh, minimizing movements and with respect to, to varying the, the, the gamma converging energies. So we have good stability estimates. You can pass to the limit the gradient flows. And uh, then you can apply this abstract result to fractional uh, heat flows once you notice that the energy functionals are uniformly lambda convex. Final slide, let me just say what we, we have done. Uh, so uh, I consider the limit of geometric evolutions focusing on fractional uh, geometric flows. Uh, but in fact, you could consider also different sequences of uh, curvatures converging to a limit curvature. For instance, you can treat the case of uh, regularized the Minkowski content, where you, you approximate the perimeter with the area of a neighborhood of the boundary of the set, and you compute the corresponding first variations. Then concerning the gradient flows, uh, we have considered the case of S tending to zero. The case S, which tends to one, it's even easier. The energy converges to the Dirichlet energy. The gradient flow converges to the gradient flow of the Dirichlet energy, which is the classical with equation. And uh, some other questions are uh, the following. For instance, uh, working a little bit with strong solutions instead of uh, solutions for the geometric flows. For instance, uh, for this new zero fractional, uh, perimeter curvature and curvature flow, it would be interesting to, to see if there are uh, strong solutions, at least for short time. And for positive S, this has been proved recently by Vesa Yulin and, Laman and uh, Lamanna. Then it would be interesting to consider uh, uh, the case where P is different than two. Now P 
when I was talking about the Ayabdus semi norm, I was always fixing P equal to two. For instance, for P equal to one, we are dealing and S, which is converging to, to one, rather than with the fractional lit flows converging to the classical lit flow, we are dealing with the total variation flow. So fractional total variation flows converging to the local total variation flows. Last, uh, our stability results for geometric flows are based on very strong assumptions on strong continuity, strong convergence of the curvatures. Clearly, it would be interesting to somehow weak this assumption. And I have theorems relying uh, more on, uh, energe um, on uh, convergence of the energies of the perimeters, so gamma convergence of the perimeters, plus, of, co of course, something, because convergence of the perimeters is not, not enough to guarantee convergence of the derivatives and then on the, on the flow. But it would be interesting to understand some of which are the minimal assumptions that guarantee, you know, if you have just convergence of the energies, you consider the corresponding uh, gradient flow, you can have a lot of pinning effects uh, that in the limit formally disappear, but that slow down the dynamics. So the, the general question is, uh, which are the assumptions uh, together with the convergence of the perimeters that guarantee that in the limit there are no pinning uh, effects uh, and that you have convergence of the evolution. Okay, maybe a little um, a minutes late, so I'm sorry I stopped here and, and I thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you, Marcello, for a very interesting talk. Are there any questions from people from here? If not, I, I ask a question. Um, so you just mentioned the fact that uh, recently has been proven also that there are classical solutions for the zero mean curvature flow, and uh, you use a viscosity solution. Uh, is there any weak, strong uniqueness uh, if you try to prove something like, like this? Um, sorry, say again for the fractional. Uh, so uh, since only for the zero mean curvature flow there are classical solution, and you have uh, your uh, viscosity mm -hmm. solution. Are you able to prove weak strong uniqueness? Uh, weak strong, you mean that you take strong solutions? Uh, and now, what do you mean by weak strong? Uh, that you have your weak solution and you know that it is exactly the strong solution. So they coincide. If they, okay, if they, if, they if it is strong, then it coincides with the weak. Huh? This is the question. No, this is the question. I don't know. So the question is starting from an initial set which is regular to prove that for a short time it is regular. For instance, uh, proving like uh, some uh, kind of having some contraction argument as you were showing to us today. So proving some, uh, some uh, that for, for short time you have an implicit function theorem. And then uh, um, uh, once you have a strong solution, uh, by comparison, it should be easy to, to see that this strong solution is the unique solution. Okay, okay, so they coincide. Yeah. But the point is construct uh, strong solutions for short time. Yeah, since at least in the case of zero mean curvature flow are already there. And I, I, I don't I think I'm not aware of. Okay, are there are other questions? <laughs> Maybe it's someone from home. Uh, hi, I have a question. Michael, please. So, uh, yeah, so for your abstract result, uh, what's the connection with this uh, Sarfati and Sandier result? Of, uh... Uh, the, I mean, the connection is that what we did is easy. I, so, there is not really a connection. I would say that their result is in the case where they, they don't have uh, an Hilbert structure. So, our, uh, our results somehow. It, not really comparable with that result. So that their results say somehow that if you have convergence of the energies plus some condition ensuring the convergence of the slopes of these energies, then you have a convergence of the gradient flows. Somehow this convergence of the slopes in our case uh, is automatic because we are dealing not really with convex functionals, but with the lambda convex functionals. So, the, the abstract result, uh, 
essentially is known, I, I don't know, it's well understood, it's uh, stability of uh, gradient flows with respect to, to lambda convex functions. So we, have, we had to, we proved this result because we couldn't find exactly the, the results in the, in the formalism that we needed. But then the point was to, to check that our energies were uniformly lambda convex and uniformly lambda positive. So I have maybe a second. So I, I don't know if formally you can deduce this result from the statement of the result based on the uncertainty, but it's, I mean, this is it. So maybe I have a second question. So mm -hmm. for this uh, zero, zero uh, perimeter, I mean, you looked at the zero order and first order gamma convergence. And yeah. To look, at, to look at higher order gamma convergence uh, expansion or? I couldn't hear you, sorry. I mean, Can you, you looked at like the zero order and first order gamma convergence expansion for the uh, yes. these perimeters. Would it be interesting or not to look at higher order uh, gamma convergence expansion? Like second order? Or... You ask if you have higher order gamma convergence. I think, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, we don't have, but we were, um, somehow we were uh, satisfied with the first order gamma convergence. Because uh, again, the, the zero order gamma convergence already gives something, but gives something that uh, somehow you can interpret as a, a no local perimeter, but it is very degenerate in the sense that, for instance, uh, if, you, if you think about um, isoprimetric inequalities, if the energy itself is the volume, it's clear that everything would be a minimizer of this isoprimetric inequality. So the volume can be understood as a perimeter but not really interesting. <laughs> While the, the first order gives already something which is really attractive and for which this, the isoperimetric solution is a ball. And, um, and so we, we didn't, uh, we didn't uh, develop further. We didn't look for extra terms in the expansion of the energies. In fact, you can, uh, you can do uh, expansion of the energy for uh, S uh, tending to one. Again, in this case, the limit is not degenerate because it's the Euclidean perimeter, but still uh, it's, you can uh, look at the next uh, term in the energy. Uh, I don't remember which is the result because it's a result by Cesaroni and Novaga, but you can get something which describes the next term very precisely and, and also the, the curvature of the next order very precisely. Thank you. Okay, I hope you heard me. <laughs> Maybe we lost Maybe all of them. I don't know. Hey, since uh, Michael is not answering. Uh, yeah, so yeah. Maybe... Thank you. Thank okay. you. Sorry, I said thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, we I was thank, thinking about um, this paper of uh, Cesano in Novaga that I was coming. I think I was thinking about. Okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> we, thank Marcel. we thank Marcel again for his talk and we proceed with the next thank slide. <laughs>
obstacle time problem for hyperbolic evolution equation. For instance, a nonlinear linear wave equation, possibly known local operator, which he used to model in various situations, for instance, like uh, the, vibration, the vibrating of a string hitting uh, the desk or the parallel of phenomenon where you take into account the vibration of a membrane which are parallel up from the substrate. The other motivation is coming from the model uh, where we take into account the fractional diffusion propagation in non-homogeneous media or homogeneous media. To be more specifically, in the obstacle free case, we are considering the following equation. We call it a fractional semi-linear wave equation. Uh, epsilon in a small parameter, uh, small parameter. The, the minor plus and power weight is done for the fractional, uh, fractional operator and the the potential. And the motivation is in S equal to one and the period is along the program potential. The solution give right an, an interface which is square power time like minimal surface. And this one first observed by Neil in co dimension one under some uh, priori assumption of, of the uh, structure of the solution. Uh, it proved that there are some solution, uh, there are some solution take the value be between minus one and one out of the transition layer. And the, um, the transition uh, layer certify minimal surface in Minkowski space, I uh, Minkowski space time. And then the rigorous analysis were uh, proved by uh, Gerard. Here, he given a smooth timeline minimal surface. He construct a solution such that the energy concentrate along such a given surface, but due to the smoothing assumption, this is valid for the short term. Remember, given the smooth time minimal surface. So now the question is how to extend the analysis after the onset of similarities. Uh, this is proposed by uh, Bellatini, Novaga, and Olandi, but under some conditional assumption. What does it mean? Uh, it means that if the solution verifies the condition and in the limit, the Lagrangian density will concentrate on the uh, timeline minimum of 94 of co dimension M in the uh, Lorentzian, in the Lorentzian variable developed by the same author. So now we would like to propose a scheme to construct the solution of the equation one. And our expectation is that no condition in this paper uh, could be the last for our solution. So again, we, we would like to pro propose a scheme in the spirit of minimizing movement to construct a solution of the equation one. And in the future, we, we would like to prove no condition here could be the last for our solution. The other motivation is, um, and we would like to uh, investigate the existing result for fractional k in both linear and nonlinear case. And in the linear case had been investigated, had been investigated by uh, Bonafini, Novaga, and Olandi by using the minimizing movement scheme also. So now our first goal is try to extend, extend the strategy of that paper to same linear testing. And then for the obstacle, uh, in the obstacle case, what does it mean? We given an obstacle and we are trying to, we look for the solution of the following system. The first condition is, which is a sub-solution, sub solution and the solution only lie above the obstacle. The third condition tell you that whenever the solution liable, uh, liable the obstacle is satisfied the same linear wave equation. And it satisfy the initial condition. So what is the motivation? Here the picture of the free wave but now we are required a solution liable to give an obstacle to the condition. The motivation is very few work in the hyperbolic testing, mostly for one dimensional wave. Let me list a few work here. 
the Sachman and collaborator dealing with one dimensional wave equation using the classical analysis by making use of the uh, representation of the one dimensional wave structure. And then uh, Kikuchi using the time discrete variation approach, which is exactly the minimizing movement scheme, as I mentioned before in the obstacle free K to construct a solution for one dimensional wave equation. And more recently, a similar time discrete variational method used the crank reconstruction time minimization scheme to construct the solution for one dimensional wave equation. And the wood point of this kind of uh, scheme here is, is preserved energy in the discrete level. And then fractional uh, linear wave equation has been investigated by Bonafini, Novaga, and Olandi using the minimizing movement scheme. And our second goal, we try to propose the scheme, uh, minimizing movement scheme to extend to same linear setting in that middle dimension. And we use it to study the adhesive phenomenon uh, has been investigated uh, in one dimensional okay. case. So again, now the, the main talk, now we try to propose a scheme to construct, for, uh, to construct a solution for the obstacle free case and also obstacle case. So let me start with, with the obstacle free, uh, and again, before going to the uh, obstacle free case, let me recall some notion because we are working on the uh, fractional operator. So we define it through a Fourier transform at the order if power of 2s. And then we define the bilinear form. Then we are working in a, we define the HS space. And we consider the boundary condition zero outside boundary, outside the boundary. So we're working on a chest, a chest bar here. A chest bar in the space we are working on. Very clear condition. So first is the obstacle of uh, free case. I recall the problem. We look for the solution, possible the vector value function. And decide to certify the, uh, certify the system too. So what we need to specify the condition. U0 belong to a chat bar, V0 is a L2, and potential W is U1, no negative, and have a lip chip in the gradient. Here. And so now we define what is the definition of which solution of the obstacle free case. The solution is the wish solution here. You belong to L infinity at chest bar and W1 infinity L2 have a second derivative in time belong to N minus chest. And it verify the condition three, satisfy the initial condition four. And we define the energy of the function U is the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. And the first theorem that we are going to prove today is the, is the following theorem. That's it, the weak solution for the fractional semi linear wave equation to certify the energy inequality. So then let me start uh, to what is the, we propose a scheme to construct, to prove the existing result. So what is the scheme? For any n, we divide the time interval into the n small step with the length is tau n. And you define u n minus one by u zero minus tau n v zero. And u n zero equal to u zero here. And then for every i from one, you select a minimizer of the following functional. And this is tend to the direct method of calculated variation. You obtain the minimizer, uh, a minimizer u n i. And then you, def, uh, you provide the characterization of the minimizer to give the Euler equation of the U and I. Here, see the Euler equation. And then you define the PCY constant, PCY linear interpolation over the time interval tau and t of the datum U and I. And also 
uh, v and bar, v and PCY constant and PCY linear interpolation of the velocity, of the latent velocity here. And then from the Euler equation, you integration from zero to t, you obtain the following equation, which you use to pass to the limit in the later to verify the condition of the wish solution. So now we try what it mean point out, which would like to provide energy estimate for the approaching solution in order to uh, provide a compactness result and you pass to the limit. So what is the energy estimate here? This is a key energy estimate. Uh, the first term in the, uh, in the velocity, the seminorm and the potential term of U and this is the velocity here. Less than the initial and energy plus an arrow here. So how to, let me give the idea how to prove this kind of energy estimate. From I, uh, first I from one to N, we consider the Euler equation with the following test function here. U and I minus, U and I minus one minus U and I. This is the Euler equation here. Okay. And then you often the following equation. This is the, uh, this is the, after you substitute the test function here. The first term I re, rewrite in terms of the velocity here. And then you use in the basic inequality, because you swap inequality in the first two terms, you often this kind of inequality. So now you observe that in the, uh, in the case, W equal to zero, you make a sum and then you open the telescope, uh, telescopic sum. So you open immediately the energy estimate. In the KW convest, you use in the basic inequality here, uh, basic inequality here, and uh, the crack of uh, UN of UI, UNI minus one, minus it and I, one way less than W U and I minus one W U and I here. And then you make the sum, you have the telescopic sum and you sum enough, you obtain the same energy estimate. And now how to extend to non-convex uh, non potential. And by using the idea uh, before, you add this term. You add this term in order to make uh, the telescopic sum you add this term, so you need to minus this term again, and you compare this term with this one, and it, it can be controlled by an arrow of the order tau n, and then you obtain the energy estimate. This is the idea. And then you, from the energy estimate, you can do the compactness for the approximate solution. The first uh, one, the first one we use in the Azizla Agostini theorem tends to the uniform bar of the velocity u and t. Again, and the second one is the, uh, the consequence the uh, due to the uniform bar of u and t. This is the, uh, due to the uniform bar of u and t in it, but, but it, it just and combine with the first term here in order to prove for any t here. You need to use this the first term here. In the last two terms, you need, in order to improve the second regularity in time, you have to use the Euler equation in order to provide the second regularity in time here. And then the digital compactness result for U and bar and the potential. And the last one is here. You will limit often by proposition two. You often the uh, compactness for the crack. And then let you be the limit point often by the previous compactness result. We, we, uh, we verify the uh, condition of the wish solution. We prove it in the wish solution. Stay, uh, starting from this kind of Euler equation, you often before and you pass to the limit you immediately get the, the weak equation for the, unit, for the function u. And then 
you verify the initial condition, this tends to the uh, UN conversion to U in the C0TL2 and VN conversion to VT in C0T at minus chest here. And the verify of energy inequality is easy from the energy estimate to pass to the limit. So we already uh, proposed a scheme to construct the wish solution for the obstacle free case. Now we move to the obstacle case. So let me recon, uh, okay. First, before moving to the obstacle, okay, let me talk in about the energy preserving solution. In case you have more regularity of the initial datum, you are, uh, we can by a little bit modify of the initiation step of the scheme, we can construct a solution such as it energy preserved during the evolution. And the idea is that if you have more regular initial datum, you can provide a uniform value of the, of the initial acceleration in L2 and the initial velocity in the chest. And that if it propagates for every I to obtain a uniform value of the acceleration in L2 and velocity in the chest. And then you obtain the compactness result to improve the regularity of U. Now, UT, you belong to, UT belong to a chat here and UT belong to L2. Before, UT just belong to L2, but now you can improve UT belong to a chest. And you make it like a test function in order to verify the energy uh, conservation. And the, this solution, the optimal solution here is unique in the following class here. You in the wish solution, uh, the class wish solution with UT, it belongs to a, uh, a chest. So, the, in to, so in order to prove in the energy in the, uh, energy preservation, the point you have to improve the regularity of U. UT belongs to a, a chest here. So now we move to the, uh, the obstacle case. Before we deal with the obstacle free case, now we deal with the obstacle case. Given the obstacle, we try to look for a solution satisfy the following uh, system here. With the initial datum, we, with the initial datum we lie about the obstacle. So this is the definition of the wish solution. Regarding to first the regularity of Q, here we do have the second regularity in time. Remember, before we have the second regularity in time in the obstacle free case, but here we don't have it. And within our scheme, we cannot, uh, we cannot provide. But instead, you can have the left and right limit of the, the, uh, the, uh, of the solution, and it verifies the super solution here. And this satisfies the initial condition in the following sense. This is the definition of wish solution. So we, the second uh, theorem that we are going to prove is that they said the wish solution satisfy the energy inequality. So now again, we try to modify a little bit the scheme uh, of the obstacle free case by considering uh, minimizing the, the this functional over the set of the admission, we need to over this set here, KHA is a set of you belong to a chat, only lie about the obstacle. Then you provide the characterization of the minimizer. You obtain the, the first variational inequality one. And the other, uh, the other is uh, observed phi, because then you and I also at visible test function, you open the, the second variational inequality. The first uh, variational inequality, which will be used to verify the initial condition later. And this one will be used to verify the U in the super solution. So again, we have to provide energy estimate. This time it's more easier because we already done in obstacle pre-case. 
by choosing the test function here, phi equals g u n i in the in this one, and then you often exactly uh, this one. You often exactly this one. You often exactly this uh this kind of um. Uh, inequality here and you repeat again as the obstacle free case in order to provide energy estimate again this time it's more easier because you, you already done we already on done in the obstacle free case and after opting the uh, energy estimate you can provide uh, the compactness the result for un and un bar this is just a consequence of the energy estimate Then now we try to, uh, here we don't have a second regularity in time of the, uh, the function u, but we can provide, we can prove that the uh, ut have the left and the right limit. And moreover, the left limits here on less than the right limit. What does it mean? Whenever this, the solution be, begin move upward, it continue move upward and locally in, in space time, it behaves like of a uh, same linear wave equation. And then we verify, try to verify the uh, U in, is, is in it, uh, the wish solution of, uh, of the equation. The first and the, uh, the first and the, the second condition is either consequent of, either consequent of this kind of here and the compactness result. We try to verify the, the third and the fourth condition. The third condition is U is a super solution. This is due to the variation of inequality two. You often before here. And the last two terms, you just pass to the limit. In order to deal with the, uh, the first term, you just uh, do the change of uh, variable and you pass to the limit. But be careful here. We, in the last term, 10 to zero due to the fact you take phi have the compact support not contain the, the end point T, the 10 to zero. So now you verify the, uh, you verify the, um, the initial condition. The first is easy, like in uh, obstacle free case, tends to the fact you have U and conversion to U in C zero T L2. But now in order to verify the velocity condition, you have to take, uh, you consider the following quantity here. This quantity is, is the acceleration quantity appear in the variation of inequality before, and you roll it this way. And just take into account the step function, uh, the, the step time, and you left the first and the last time, D star here, and the between here. And this is the, from the variation of inequality, this can be bigger than this quantity here. This one plus this one, bigger than this one. And thanks to the uh, uniform bar of Vn, Vni and Uni, you can give the upper bar, uh, the lower bar here. And then you at last, n tend to infinity. You often first the following inequality. And you let D star tend to zero along the grid point. You often the you can verify the, uh, the initial condition of the velocity. And then to verify the energy estimate, you just pass to the limit of the uh, in the energy estimate here to verify the energy equality of the weak solution. So now let me talk in about a little bit uh, the, the application of no result. Now con we consider the, the application into the hyperbolic chinook Landau equation as mentioned in the introduction. We say that uh, the solution develop, uh, derived the interface square power timeline minimal surface C. So now for each epsilon 
you didn't know U epsilon is a solution often by our scheme. Here we consider the blue uh, along the program potential of order two in order to verify the elliptic continuity condition in the obstacle free case. And then U epsilon, uh, that U epsilon be the sequence of solution constructed by the approachable scheme in the obstacle free case. Such as the initial energy, uh, the, en the initial energy verify the natural ball, and then you deduce uh, some compacted result. The first m equal to one. You give a right the compacted in L one. You belong to BV function, and the reduced boundary of the level set is the first type of the defect, and the second one is the vorticity captured by the Jacobian. The Jacobian of U, and but we still not uh, able to give the characterized uh, variation or characterization of the uh, uh, defect here. Still not. And then we try to provide a simulation here for the uh, uh, particular initial datum. Z0 have the symmetry of transition at the radius here. Inside here minus one, outside is one. And then with the velocity equal to zero, and uh, when uh, the solution is expect to keep the uh, CBT structure, and at time involved, the radius R, the, the cycle of radius R zero is kind of uh, involving, involving and collapsing to the point. We did analytical solution and we try to compare between uh, the analytical solution with the approximate solution. And you see here, we did the radius compare between the analytical solution and our approximate solution when time involved is string, the radius more or less the coincide here. And of course, the cycle will, in, uh, will shrink to a point uh, involved according to. Uh, a, ge a geometric evolution law related with the string at uh, verify the uh, the timeline minimal surface. And from this observation, we this to the following conjecture: uh, we consider the the Lagrange density of the u epsilon again. U epsilon is the Solution often by our approximate scheme. And then we, uh, we conjecture the measure it concentrate on the time line Lorentzian minimal submanifold of co dimension M and tends to, uh, tends to the, the scheme. You, we, 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 could, we could try to use the minimality of our approximate solution to provide some uh, suitable estimate to verify no condition in the paper. A Palatini, uh, Novaga, Olandi, as I mentioned in the introduction, in the obstacle free case. Now we move to the, uh, the application uh, to the nonlinear ways in the Desi phenomenon. In the joint work with Mauro Bonafini, we studied, uh, we studied the dynamic of the uh, elastic string, elastic body, interacting with a rigid substrate through an adhesive layer. And this were investigated by one, dimension, one dimensional case. And the clock function governed in the dynamic E had the following here. You in displacement of string and the potential response for the, uh, the energetic contribution of a glue layer. And it had following shape here. Here we have the whenever, what does it mean here? Whenever the solution reached to the critical state, it behaves like a freeway, but under some critical state, it influences uh, the, the, the adhesive layer, so it behaves like a safe in a wave. And also the, uh, the other, when S equal to two, the same model have the same, share the same feature here. The elastic beam interacting with the rigid substrate through the an elastic breakable uh, force in term with a bit of large, what does it mean? We just, uh, the 
consider the uh, here. Here we replace here by uh, USS here, and the same potent behavior the potential. So from this kind of motivation, we started general line model here, including including also the fractional operator with the potential it uh, had the uh, behavior before. So now the question is because do you see the discontinuity at the point? Because here we have a discontinuity here. Okay. We have the continuity at the point here. Now the question is how to define the wish solution of this kind of equation. Suppose the critical state equal to one, and we try to follow the definition as the obstacle free case in the first part, we have to define what is the W prime at uh, one and minus one. Suppose we define two and minus two. And then we try to use in the, uh, the method of approximate potential to construct approximate solution and pass to the limit. But the question now is what happened if use, for instance, this is the kind of a following the approximate potential. We consider the, uh, yeah, this is the potential. We consider W prime here. This is the W. And now we try to construct a family of the uh, a family of uh, potential, possibly kind of this. W epsilon here and W here. The set W epsilon satisfy the, the condition in on, in the obstacle free case. And we try to, for each epsilon, you open the U epsilon in the obstacle free case, where you try to pass to the limit. What happened if U epsilon tend to one, but W prime U epsilon doesn't converge to this one? Due to the discontinuity behavior at the critical state. So now we already provide a counter example for it. But we can prove by small, uh, by small initial datum. What does it mean? By small initial datum, we try to force the approximate solution lie in this way, lie inside here. Why lie inside here? Lie inside here is allowed you to approximate uniformly inside. And then you pass to the limit easier, easily. And both motivation, uh, motivation from this fact, we try to modify the potential. We not do not consider uh, the drop uh, continuously, uh, discontinued drop, but just continuously drop here. So this we can provide, we modify the, 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 the contribution of the potential by continuously drop. And then we, we are able to prove the existing result because in this case, we can approximate uniformly both W epsilon and graph epsilon at the same time. And then you can provide the energy, uh, the existing result in the general initial data. And then if you would like to deal with the discontinued here, we can use in the notion of subdifferential. But the question is also uh, how, can, how can we pass to the limit in the potential term when you use in the method here, approximate the original potential by the family of uh, W epsilon satisfy the obstacle free case. And thanks for your attention today. Thank you very much for your talk. Is there any question from People in presence. I check if there is someone remotely that want to ask something. Hi, 
I thanks for your talk. I have yes. just a curiosity. Probably it's not the main topic of uh, your talk, but uh, regarding the numerical part, yes, um, I'm curious about the fact how much the cho the choice of uh, the initial condition affect your solution. Is I think that uh, the choice of the initial datum change the the result from numeric. Is it true? Uh, actually, yeah. Uh, okay. Because I, I, I'm not the one who did the numerical uh, part here, so. Okay, no, sorry. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yes. I also wanted to ask you which kind of methods have you used for the simulation, but maybe. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask My collaborator can <laughs> tell you more about this. <laughs> maybe my collaborator can tell you more yes, about this. Exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much again. Yes. So now we have a break. Okay, probably we can start again. So we have um, Giacomo Panevari from University of Verona that is going to talk about the lifting problem for manifold value maps of bounded variation. So, let's start. Thank you, thank you very much. And I'm really glad to be here today, not only because it's the first workshop I'm able to attend physically in a long time, but also because it's the first time in Pisa actually. So I suppose I have many, many reasons to, to be grateful to the organizers and well, thank you very much. So today I'd like to talk about some joint work with Gian Domenico Orlandi. And I will be talking on the lifting problem, which is a very classical topological problem. Um, but since the workshop is in the calculus of variations, we will be talking on the lifting problem in BV. And actually, for most of the time, I will recall perhaps classical results. So if you're already familiar with the content of the talk, then I apologize to you. Now, before I introduce the problem in the setup I will be considering for most of the talk, let me um, introduce two particular cases, so to say. And the first one is the lifting problem for the circle. So we have a domain omega that's a bounded and smooth domain in our n, and we have the unit circle in the complex plane. And we have a map u that's a map from omega to the circle. It's in some function space. I just denote it generically by capital X. It could be CK if you want, why not? Uh, Sobolev, BV, it will be BV for most of the talk. Anyway, some functions, and then you ask yourself whether give a, given any such map, is it true that there exists a lifting? So that will be a real value function phi, still defined on omega, uh, with the same regularity, and that's really the most important uh, bit of information. Uh, and you want that u is equal to the exponential of phi phi at almost every point in your domain. And again, you want to preserve the regularity from u to phi, so you want them to belong say, to the same Sobolev space, for instance, or, or something like that. Anyway, I suppose there are so many reasons why people get in, got interested in, in this kind of problem, and probably from the point of view of the calculus of variations and PD, one of them would be the study of the Ginzburg Landau functional, which was initially a model for superconductivity. And then it was made uh -huh. popular in the mathematical community by the work <laughs> by Bichir and Resist in the mid 90s. Well, um, I was saying, yes, the answer to the lifting problem depends, of course, on the choice of your function space. So, for instance, if you want to look at CK maps, uh, well, it's a very classical statement that any CK maps with values in the circle as a CK lifting, so long as your domain is simply connected, then you can find it. I mean, this statement in any, in your favorite textbook in topology or perhaps complex analysis. Well, if you move to Sobolev spaces, for instance, then, then things get a bit more complex. And well, the study of the problem was initiated in Sobolev spaces, I mean, by Bituel and Zeng, and then Bituel and Demongel, and it was completely settled by Bougain, Redis, and Mironescu in a series of works. And we will come back to, the, to this point, but why is it so that the problem in, in Sobolev spaces becomes more complex? 
actually there are several reasons, one of them being the presence or possible presence of topological singularity. So we consider what um, uh, the, the hedger. It's a two dimensional example. My domain is a two dimensional disk. And I look at the radially symmetric unit vector field X over mod X, which belongs to W1P, for instance, for any P less than two strictly, and has a singularity at the origin. It's a topological singularity. It has a non-zero topological degree. Now, um, if you try to find the lifting for such a map, well, that's the same as finding a choice of the argument, a choice of the phase in the sense of complex analysis. And for instance, you can start with phi equals zero here, but then you move all around the singularity and you come back with phi equal to two pi. So there's a jump in the lifting. You can make other choices of the lifting, but still there will be a jump anyway because of topological obstructions. That's it, it's due to the topological singularity. And so as the lifting has a jump, there is no lifting in W1P, even if you start from a map in W1P. So you see topological singularities may be a problem. And then again, you could consider the problem in BV. You could, start, you could study uh, Bezov spaces if you want. So that, that's been done by Mironesco, Hust, and Sia, for instance, and variations of that. Now, the second particular case I'm interested in, that would be the lifting problem for the real projective plane, RP2. That's a manifold you obtain when you take the sphere, two-dimensional sphere, unit sphere, S2, and you identify each point in the sphere with the opposite point, N with minus N. And here you see an embedding of RP2 as a set of matrices. So I consider the three bar three real matrices of the following form, it's N tensor N, times a constant, where n is a unit vector in R3. Uh, now you see this particular set of matrices is parameterized in terms of a unit vector, but if you change n into minus n, you get the same matrix. And that's why you can, you can actually check that, that this set is, is a manifold and it's diffeomorphic to RP2. In fact, even isometric and Having an isometry is the whole uh, point of having this constant here. If I if I am correct with the computations, maybe I got the right the the wrong constant. Apologies for that. But anyway, it doesn't matter too much for our purposes today. Now, um, the problem for the real projective plane would be given a map Q. I call it now. Uh, that's again a map from my domain omega to R P two, and it belongs to some function space. Given any such map, can I find the lifting? And now the lifting will be a sphere valued map with the same regularity, but that Q is equal to N tensor N times a constant M at any point in my domain. And I suppose one possible motivation for this problem comes from the uh, material science. Uh, for instance, in the study of variational models for pneumatic liquid crystals, where the real projective plane really plays a key role because, um, well, material, uh, liquid crystals are a class of phases of matter, and you can think of a material which is composed by rod-shaped molecules, except the molecules are symmetric. There is no clearly distinguished head or tail. The two ends of the molecules look the same. So uh, when you want to parameterize or describe the orientation of such a molecule, it's perhaps a good idea to use an element of the real protective plane and to forget about the uh, sign of the unit vector. Now, again, if you're interested in CK maps, uh, then, and your domain is simply connected, the existence of a lifting is completely classical. If you're interested in subalip spaces, there might be issues, and the problem has been studied by people, for instance, both Zernescu and, and, and Mucci, and again, there could be topological singularities. For instance, in this case, you could have non-orientable singularities. Here you see uh, some projected valued map, which are drawn as a vector field, basically, except I forgot to put arrows on my vectors. And if I try to assign an orientation, an orientation so if I try to find a lifting to the sphere, well, I cannot do that in a continuous way all around the singularity. Necessarily, I must introduce a jump. Again, 
by topological reason. So even if you start from a configuration such as the one in the left, on the left, which is in W1P for any P less than two, the lifting is chumps and therefore it's not in the same uh, Sobolev space. Now it's time for me to introduce the problem in the general setting I will be considering, and that will be the lifting problem for a closed manifold. So I take a manifold N, that's a closed Riemannian manifold. Uh, I mean, it's a Riemannian manifold, it's smooth, compact, connected, no boundary, very nice object. Um, and I consider what's known as the um, Riemannian universal cover of N. Now, I will not give a precise definition just because of time constraints, but um, in a nutshell, the Riemannian universal cover of a given manifold N is two things. There's another manifold E, and there's a map pi from E to N. The manifold E will be, uh, well, another complete Riemannian manifold, which uh, look, from a local point of view is locally isometric to N. But globally, E is required to be simply connected, while in general N is not. For instance, if N is the unit circle, then I can take as E the real line. And locally, the circle and the real line are locally isometric. If you take a very small arc in the circle, and if you take a straight line segment, well, from the point of view of the metric, there's no difference. But of course, the circle is not simply connected and the real line is. Or again, real projective plane as N and the uh, sphere as E. From the point of view of the metric, locally they are the same thing, a very small patch on the projective plane and the small patch of the sphere, no metric difference. But globally, one of them, the sphere is simply connected and the other one is not. And then there's a map pi between E and N, which is some sort of projection. So for instance, the uh, complex exponential in case your manifold N is the circle or this projection from the unit vector N to the corresponding matrix in case your manifold N is the um, real projective plane. And if you define things properly, it turns out that, well, um, the uh, universal cover always exists. I mean, I'm talking about closed manifolds here. It's a very nice topological spaces. Anyway, the universal cover always exists and it's unique up to isometries. However, I have assumed that I'm starting from a manifold N which is compact. The universal cover may or may not be compact. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. For instance, circle that's compact manifold but the universal cover, the real line is not compact. Projective plane, as a compact universal cover, which is the sphere. And then I can now define properly my function spaces. And I will do that in a very low tech uh, way. I will consider Euclidean embeddings. So I will assume that both N and E are embedded as sub manifolds of Euclidean spaces. And I can always do that because of Nash theorem. And then if I want to define say subolab spaces with values in N, well, I know what Sobolev spaces with values in the ambient Euclidean space are. And I only, um, I, so I consider Sobolev maps in the sense of the ambient space and I impose a pointwise constraint almost everywhere. And if I'm given a map E, uh, sorry, a map U with values in N and a map V with values in E, I will say that V is a lifting for U in case u is equal to the composition pi of v almost everywhere. And the lifting problem will be, is it true that given any map in a u in a suitable function space with values in n, is it true that I can find the lifting v with values in e preserving the regularity, so in the same function space? So CK maps on simply connected domain, that's textbook topological statement, yes, you can. For Sobolev maps, um, we sometimes can find the lifting, sometimes we cannot, but there's a result which characterizes completely the answer to the lifting problem the way I just formulated it. And actually the result comes in two parts, depending on whether the manifold upstairs, so the universal cover, 
is, com is compact or not. And I think I will state at least half of the result because I like it very much. Um, I will consider the case E is compact. And that case is due to Mironesco and Van Schaftingen. So suppose your domain omega is bounded, it's smooth always, and suppose it's simply connected. And then suppose that your manifold upstairs, the universal cover, is compact, which is the case, for instance, if you consider as a manifold n the real projective plane, but not for the circle. For the circle, the universal cover would be the real line, not compact. That's the case we are going to see in a moment. Anyway, suppose the E is compact and then the lifting property holds, meaning it's true that any, func any map U in WSP from omega to n has a lifting in WSP. That's true if and only if a certain condition holds. That is, that's true if and only if uh, the product SP is either strictly less than one or it's greater than or strictly, uh, sorry, it's greater than or equal to two. It might seem a bit weird that this sort of two, um, well, this condition with two cases here, but actually it's quite nice. It says that the, uh, say, the main obstruction to the existence of the lifting, perhaps the only obstruction, even though maybe it's not entirely correct to say that this is the only, well, it's anyway, the main source of trouble when it comes to the existence of the lifting in this case is the presence of topological obstructions, such as the uh, non orientable singularities for projective valued maps. Because the point is, whenever you have this sort of, for instance, non-orientable singularities, the lifting jumps. And then you have two cases, depending on the parameter SP, which measures the regularity of your Sobolev space. So if SP is greater than or equal to two, it means you're regular enough. Basically, you, you cannot have this sort of topological singularities, which might, may lead to troubles. Of course, you might have other topological singularities in your Sobolev space, for sure, they are not necessarily continuous map, but not this uh, worrying type of singularities. And therefore, there's no problem with the lifting. I mean, you can at least construct it. On the other end, if SP is strictly less than one, that's the low regularity case where you can have plenty of singularities such as these ones. But that's, well, as a consequence, the lifting will have jumps, possibly, but that's not a problem because if SP is strictly less than one, jumps are allowed in your Sobolev space. So, well, the lifting has jumps, but that's fine. We are fine with that. We can still construct the lifting in the same Sobolev space. And there's an intermediate regime when SP is between one and two, where you can see the topological singularities, the lifting has jumps, but that's not admissible in the Sobolev space when SP is between one and two. And that's why in the intermediate regime, you don't have necessarily this, uh, say, general lifting problem uh, property. And then there's the other case, which perhaps I will not discuss entirely. Um, the other case is when E is not compact. Actually, it was proven before, um, that's due to Betuel and Chiron, and they were generalizing a result by Bougam, Resist, and Mironescu. Bougam, Resist, and, Mir Bougam, Resist, and Mironescu was a result for the circle. Betuel and Chiron for general uh, manifolds such that the universal cover is uh, not compact. In that case, the result is slightly more complex because on top of the topological obstructions, you have also uh, analytical issues which have something to do with the non-local nature of the norms. Uh, so when you're working with fractional Sobolev spaces, you might have troubles. And also let me remark that whether or not your uh, universal cover is compact and whether or even if you are in a case that you have the lifting property. So even if you're in a case where you're sure that the lifting exists in the relevant Sobolev space, it doesn't necessarily uh, mean that you can have an inequality on the lifting. On equal inequalities of this form might fail, uh, even if you have existence of the lifting. And again, that's mostly the case when you work with non-local norms. 
But anyway, so far for the problem in subalert spaces, because actually what we considered together with Gian Domenico, I mean, that was the problem in BV. Now, BV seems quite a reasonable space to look for the existence of liftings, because after all, if the problem, or at least part of the problem is that liftings sometimes jump, well, if you're in BV, you're not scared of jumping. So you should expect to have liftings in BV sometimes. And indeed, there are results uh, that guarantee the existence of a lifting in BV. First, in case your manifold is a circle, and that's due originally to uh, Jacquinta, Modica, and Suchek, and then revisited by Davil and Ignat, and Ignat alone later on. And also in case your manifold is a real projective plane or real projective spaces, higher dimensional ones, uh, there were results uh, by Bull and Bedford in a way, uh, Bedford then and Ignat and Lamy later on. And just as a quick reminder, I will um, still for the moment work with extrinsically defined BV spaces. So I'm still, looking at my manifolds as being embedded as sub-manifolds of some Euclidean ambient. And when I say BV, I mean BV in the sense of the ambient space for the time being. Now, the result goes that even for more general closed manifolds, still you do have a lifting property in BV. So you give me a bounded and smooth domain in any dimension. It doesn't even have to be a simply connected domain if you work in BV. And then it's true that any map U in BV with values in N has a lifting in BV with values in E. And moreover, you can make sure that the BV semi-norm, so the total variation of the derivative of the lifting is controlled in terms of the total variation of the derivative of U. And additionally, if you start from a map U, which is in SBV, so no counterpart for the, for the derivative, and if you have a lifting which is in BV, then in fact the lifting must be in SBV. Now the second part is just a consequence of the uh, chain rule for BV functions, because if there's some lift, some counterpart upstairs, it must be projecting downstairs as well. But the main bit of information is the um, existence of the lifting, and you have a corresponding inequality here that's essentially possible because you're working with a local. Uh, quantity, a local semi-norm. As a couple of side remarks, when you work in BV, you do have existence of liftings. You certainly don't have uniqueness of liftings because, for instance, if your manifold is a circle, I take the map which is constantly equal to one, I mean the complex number one, that's a map with values in the circle, and now I take any set A upon a perimeter, and I consider V being equal to uh, two pi, the indicator function of A. And that's a perfectly good lifting in BV of my map U. So I have plenty of liftings of U in BV. So not a chance at all to have uniqueness, but at least in this example, maybe there's some sort of you know, topological structure, at least in this particular example, because anyway, I have plenty, plenty of liftings but the jump set for the liftings, in this case, I mean, it's a boundary. It's the reduced boundary of the uh, set A of finite perimeter. And actually, maybe I will be able to say a few words towards the end of the talk. There is non-uniqueness, but sometimes there is some sort of topological structure which is hidden in this um, BV lifting business. And again, the best constant, you have an inequality here with an implied constant. The method of proof we have works for general manifolds, but we have no idea whatsoever what the best constant is in general. But in particular cases, so when the manifold is a circle or the projective plane, the best constant has been um, provided by, by previous uh, results. And again, as a side remark, um, if you're interested in W1P maps uh, with P in general just greater than or equal to one, well, it's not always the case that you can find the sublet lifting in W1P, but at least thanks to results of this form, you can find the lifting in SBV. So at least you do have some lifting in a weaker space somehow. And 
as an additional remark, so far I've been working with the uh, extrinsically defined BEV spaces, and in particular, I had a total variation for the derivative, which contains the jump set, and in the jump, uh, sorry, jump part, and in the jump part, I integrate over the Euclidean distance between the traces. Now, if you're working with manifold valued maps, perhaps it might be a good idea to use a geodesic distance instead. And um, the geodesic distance between the traces. And you can do that. You define a new functional that will be some sort of intrinsic analog of the BV semi norm. Now, by definition, this geodesic distance is always greater than or equal to the Euclidean distance. So the second line is always greater than or equal to the first. And if your manifold is compact, you also have an opposite inequality up to um, some, some prefactor, some constant prefactor. So if your manifold is compact, well, the two quantities here are essentially equivalent. But if your manifold is not compact, and when you take the universal cover of a compact manifold, you may end up having something non-compact. Well, the two quantities are, are, are just, you know, in principle, they're just an inequality between them, but this one can be very, very larger. So I define a new space, which I call BV intrinsic. That's a space of maps of, uh, which are BV in the previous sense, such that additionally, this second quantity is finite. And I call it BV intrinsic, even though the definition I provide you here is still making reference to an embedding. But that's because you can check that this space actually coincides with um, some, some previously defined notions of BV spaces uh, for metric, uh, for, for uh, when the target is a metric space, for instance, uh, the BV space in the sense of Ambrosio or Kurevar and Schoen. There's plenty of definitions and Essentially, in the case we're interested in, this is yet another equivalent characterization. And if you work in this BV intrinsic space, well, you still have a lifting result, which is analogous to the previous one, and you have an inequality between the intrinsic quantities, the intrinsic functionals. Now, um, as a corollary, I'd like to say, well, a few words on the problem of density of smooth maps in BV. And uh, well, there's a result by Jacquinta and Mucci, which I think can be expressed in the following form. Uh, suppose you have a domain, suppose bounded and smooth as always, etc., and you have a complete Riemannian manifold, which is simply connected. And then you have a map which is in BV intrinsic, let's say with values in your, in your manifold. I call the manifold E here because in the application I'm going to give in a second, I, I'm, I'm thinking that E is the universal cover. So it's not necessarily compact anyway. I have a map V with, in BV intrinsic with values in E, then I can approximate it by a sequence of smooth maps. And the approximation is going to be in the strong L1 sense, and also I have a control on the norms. I mean, the, B, the W11 semi-norm of the approximating sequence really converges to the intrinsic functional, which is a sort of counterpart of, of previously known results for, for the Sobolev um, case. As a couple of remarks, I think that actually the original, the original statement by Jacquinta Mucci is in case the domain is a ball and the manifold E is assumed to be compact, but once you have proved uh, the case, your domain is a ball and your manifold E is compact, and really that's the hard and technical part. Once you have that, you can extend it to, to general complete Riemannian manifold and also uh, other types of domains. And the extension is, well, it's not very, um, it's, it's definitely much, much, much uh, on a, <laughs> much lower level of, of technicality. And um, on the other end, the assumption that your manifold E is simply connected here is really crucial. And if your manifold is not simply connected, the statement is not true anymore in this form. So if your target is simply connected, you do have density of smooth maps in BV. 
and that's provided to you by Jacinto Mucci. But what if you're interested to a non -simply, in a non-simply connected target? But then you can lift, because that's the beauty of the lifting. You end up with something which is simply connected by definition. So now if you give me a map, uh, which is in BV with values in a not necessarily simply connected manifold N, well, then I consider the lifting of U, which will be in BV intrinsically even by the previous result. And then I approximate the lifting, thanks to Joaquin Tanmucci, by a sequence of smooth maps, and then I project everything downstairs. And so I end up with density of smooth maps for the um, non-simply connected target. However, instead of having a very sharp equality here, I only have an inequality here. That's because I only have an inequality here by, uh, between the semi-norm of the lifting and the semi-norm of U. Well, let's say the intrinsic analogs of this semi-norm. So I have an inequality here and the constant C can be uh, strictly greater than one in general. Very quickly, perhaps I'll show you an example, a very classical example, to convince you why the constant C in this density result sometimes has to be strictly greater than one. So the example is the simplest one, perhaps in this kind of business, the hedger. So my domain is the 2D disk, and my vector field, my map, is the, uh, the manifold I'm looking at as the, is the, circle, is the unit circle, and my map is the, um, the hedgehog x over mod x. So let's say I can approximate the hedgehog. Well, let's say I consider a sequence of smooth approximations of the hedgehog, uh, a sequence which converges to the hedgehog in L1, it's bounded in BV, and is a sequence of smooth maps with values in the circle. So I can lift all the approximations UK, I can write them in terms of a map phi K, and then you can check that the sequence of liftings, I'm very sorry, the sequence phi k will be bounded in BV. So you can extract a subsequence, pass to the lifting, and then you can check that the limit of the liftings is the lifting of the limit. Everything works very, very nicely and, and fine. Anyway, you end up having that the uh, phi k converge weakly in BV to a lifting for the head. Good. So now, you have the energy, the BV energy of the approximations that's easily checked to be the same BV energy of the liftings because lifting is defined in terms of sine, of sine and cosine. But then this one bounds from above or rather is bounded from below by the BV energy of the lifting. And the lifting for a hedgehog, any lifting for the hedgehog must have a jump. So in the BV energy of the lifting, there will be an absolutely continuous part, which is the well, W11 energy or BV energy of the hedger, but also a jump part for the lifting. And you can easily prove that this jump part for the lifting is bounded from below by two pi, uh, two pi times one, one being the radius of the disc, as I perhaps forgot to, forgotten to say at the beginning. Anyway, you see here that the minimum energy which is required to approximate your hedgehog is strictly greater than the, the energy of the hedgehog itself. There's an additional term two pi. And as a side remark, this additional term two pi, which can be seen as two pi times one, may also be related to a solution of a plateau problem. So that's the, um, the minimum energy which is required to approximate the hedgehog is the same as the energy of the hedgehog itself plus two pi times the infimum among all curve, uh, infimum of length among all curves that connect the singularity at the origin with a point at the boundary. So that seems to be some sort of long stretch, perhaps some, uh, some coincidence that you can express this, this minimum energy in terms of a plateau problem. But that's not the case. It's definitely not a coincidence. And this is the last thing I'd like to say. So we consider the relaxed energy, the so-called relaxed energy. You give me a map in BV with values in a manifold N. 
And then I want to consider the minimum energy which is required in order to approximate my map U by smooth maps. So that's the inf of liminf. I take any possible sequence of approximating smooth maps that converge strongly in a one to U. And then I compute the, well, the intrinsic analog of the BV seminorm. So the, um, well, the intrinsic analog, analog of the BV seminorm in this case is just a W11 seminorm because I'm having, I'm talking of smooth maps. But then I take the limim and I take the infimum over all possible sequences of approximation. So basically I'm taking the uh, W11 seminorm, I'm restricting it to the class of smooth maps with values in my manifold N. And then I'm taking the lower semi-continuous envelope of that. And that's called the relaxed energy. Something which, which is very classical, it has been studied before, of course, first in the quadratic setting, the W112 instead of BV, and that was by Betuel, um, Brésis, and, and, and Courant, and then generalized by, by Jacquin, Tamodic, and Suchek with applications to liquid crystals. It has been considered in this very BV setting by, by Jacquin and Mucci again. They provided a characterization of relaxed energy in terms of, of Cartesian current. And just as a comment, the um, relaxed energy turns out to be related to the lifting because in fact, you can see that the minimum energy which is required in order to approximate U by smooth maps, so the relaxed energy, is also the minimum energy which is required to lift U, so uh, right hand side here. So there's a relation between the two problems. And now what I want to say is that we have a, well, I must probably skip that in the interest of time. We have a preliminary result at, or a partial result at least, which um, expresses or characterizes somehow the uh, relaxed energy for W11 maps. So it's still a, you know, a restricted subclass. And you need to make some assumptions. So suppose that your domain is simply connected. Okay, suppose that your manifold is homogeneous. It means um, if you give me any two points in your manifold, I can find a global isometry which sends one of the points into the other. Basically around each point, the manifold looks the same from the point of view of the metric. And I need to make a topological assumptions that is, I want the fundamental group of the manifold to be a billion, which is, you know, um, undesirable for some applications, but at least it covers at least the circle, the real projective plane and, and some other examples. And then you give me a W11 map. So not BV, just W11 map with values in N. And in this case, we can find, well, there's a representation for the um, relaxed energy, which mimics the, uh, or extends the one we have seen before in case of the hatchet. So the relaxed energy is going to have, well, the W11 energy plus an additional contribution, which is expressed in terms of a plateau problem. So you see here in this uh, plateau problem, there's S of U. That's, uh, that's um, well, that's, that's a flat chain. That's a, yes, that's a flat chain of dimension N minus two which corresponds to the um, topological singularities of, of the map U. Basically, it's the flat chain John Domenico Orlandi was talking about yesterday in his talk. Anyway, it's a flat chain with coefficients in the fundamental group of your manifold. And it tells you where the topological singularities of U are located and what is the topological nature of the singularities of co-dimension two. And it serves as a boundary datum for your plateau problem. So now you take all uh, rectifiable chains of dimension n minus one t. You can, uh, you, I mean, you are restricted to the chains of dimension n minus one whose boundary is precisely equal to the, well, topological singularities of u relative to your domain omega. By this, I mean that there could be uh, some portion of, of the boundary of T, which also lies in the boundary of your domain omega. But inside the domain omega, 
the boundary of T is precisely equal to the topological singularity of U. And then they must define a suitable notion of, of, of mass for, for the rectifiable chain. I mean, it's the usual notion of mass for a rectifiable chain with coefficients in a norm abelian group, except that they must, uh, sorry, define a suitable norm. So in other way on the coefficient group. So in other way, um, mass is a weighted area functional, but I need to choose the weight in a suitable way. And then to minimize the mass, over this topological constraint. And what I get here is precisely the additional contribution to the uh, relaxed energy. And if you compare the, the form, the equation which is in here and the equation which was before for the hedgehog, ah, sorry, you see that there is an additional factor of two pi here, but that's not really a loss. It's just that it has been absorbed into the definition of M. So if you define M suitably, what you see here is nothing but a generalization of what you had before. And perhaps let me mention that the way we do that is that, uh, well, I don't know what to find it. Anyway, um, in order to, to, to prove the result, what we do is that to, given a certain map V, which is in BV with values in the universal cover E, uh, Assuming that the projection of V is a W11 map, you can construct, I mean, the lifting still is in BV, the lifting could have a jump, and you can enrich the jump with a structure of a rectifiable chain. And it turns out that this additional structure, um, which takes into account some topological multiplicities and so on, it has some nice topological properties, but I don't think I have time to uh, enter into all this. this business. So what I want to do now is just to thank you all very much for your patience and your attention. Thank you very much. Someone want to ask a question, make a comment? Okay, maybe I ask, can I ask you something? So um, you just said that you define differently the mass. No, I have not understood to, to have the two pi that is inside the definition. Yes. So how, how you do this? You do this depending on the problem. Yes, depending on the manifold. I mean, these are really flat chains with coefficients in an abelian norm group. So I must define a coefficient group, um, which will be the fundamental group of my manifold N but I also must introduce a norm on it. And the norm will be choose depending on the manifold N and depending on the manifold E upstairs. And basically in case of the, um, in case of, uh, in case N is the circle, the norm I will choose is just the norm of an integer will be by definition two pi times the absolute value of the integer. And the norm is tailored on the problem or is a specific way in general to construct this norm? Well, the norm is, um, you're assuming that your manifold is homogeneous and that's key to define the norm in this form because if the manifold were not homogeneous, you would need to do something different and, and you would not end up with, with that statement. But let me guess for any, let me write it this, Well, for any, actually the way I prefer to, to see it, if, if you forgive me now, is that the fundamental group is the same as the set of automorphism of the, of the um, cover, and then the norm of an element of the fundamental group will be Okay, so, so there is a procedure in general. Yes, there is a procedure, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. And otherwise you can express it in terms of minimizing geodesics in the class gamma, in the homotomy class gamma in the manifold N. Yep, so, sorry, Paul. Sorry, there is a question from uh, Shambol. Maybe you can open, simply open your microphone and ask. Antonin, we are not hearing you. 
You still have uh, the micro off, Antonin. Can you hear me now? No, yes, no. thank you. Okay, sorry. Um, no, I, actually, I had a question, but I think this last slide 19 answered more or less the question because on, on, on slide 10, you had this, uh, on slide 10, you have this inequality, which is your starting point, more or less. Yes, one. the star. And I was wondering what was the constant here, but uh, your last slide is more or less saying that the constant is related to the constant of the isoperimetric uh, inequality for 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 well, change of dimension and one. It's n. Really, it it depends on the manifold n. I think for the circle, the constant two is fine. And I don't remember exactly. No, but it should depend on omega, no. Not so, not so sure for the circle and for the real projective plane. I'm, I think that the. Um, but it's the your last thing. If you have two, if you have two Dirac masses, for instance. Okay, I was thinking more about uh, RP two. If you have two Dirac masses in RP two, then you have to connect them with the line. So the length of the line, more or less, which appears, no. Well, yes, but the point is, okay. The uh, I'm sorry. Can I? You can connect the length of the line. I mean, you must, you need to connect the length of the line, but the length of the line is already paid for essentially in the term P of, I mean, the point is. Okay, I thought, uh, uh, yes. Right, so I'm not sure you're... whether you can see, but yes, yes, I can. No, no, I cannot. Oops, I could. Anyway, uh, okay, I will not. But the point is, the point is, um, you don't need to pay extra for the. No, what I've done? What have I done? Oh, I'm I'm terrible. The point is, you don't need to pay extra for the line. Uh, the price of the line is is basically covered by by what you pay in energy when you do this. There a way you can use a cursor. Yes, like this. Yeah, this is the price mm -hmm. of the line, basically. Tons yes, but yes, sure. Ah. And if you have another one, um, no. What was that the thing? Yeah, but it should depend on the distance between the two singularities, no? Because if you have a very elongated domain, for instance. Yes. 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 Similar singularities. Ah yes, but that's if you but that's if you put if you choose to put the jump in here. But I could choose to put the jump here, for instance. Ah, you're right. You're right. Okay. 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 And then so, okay. So that's interesting. So and then it's independent on the distance. Ah, yeah, and it's related also to okay. I get it. To your. I mean, there uh, exists sort of a lifting which satisfies the inequality, but then there might be plenty of others who yeah, sure. which don't okay, okay, okay. satisfy the inequality. I, uh, thank you. So also in your last problem, actually, when you. When you have this minimum problem with a boundary of t equals to to the mass, you can you can connect to the boundary, and have yeah. a very small. Uh, okay. I sure. mean, yes, Thank of you. course. Okay, I, definitely. I was not. Uh, definitely. Thanks. There is also another question by Michael. So, if u is in BV, do you expect the result to be analogous, or do you expect something else, namely w11 is only a technical assumption or not? I expect something. I expect something which will be uh, presumably quite abstract. So not very informative in practice because it's, an, it's a result which presumably will be formulated in terms of there exists a certain unknown functions and we don't know anything about it except that it exists. And there exists some classes which we don't know anything about them except that they exist. And also expect these, this result to be very, very, very non-canonical. I mean, I don't know, that's my expectation, at least for the type of results we have in mind. Uh, but if you make certain choices, then you can construct things, but maybe in a very non-canonical way. While in W11, after all, there's some certain canonicity, so to speak. I understand it's very vague, but that's also because our ideas so far are quite vague. We are still not there. But anyway, thank you for your question. I hope it was. So thank you very much again. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for this uh, section talk.
and the appointment is for tomorrow at 9 30. 